patience. This is the afternoon session of the Portland City Council on December 7th, 2017. Carla, please call the roll. You Daly? Fritz. Here. Fish? Here. Saltzman? Here. Wheeler? Here. Please call the first item. Item 1316, request, I'm sorry, amend street vacation ordinance to replace certain conditions and add conditions applicable to the vacated portion of Southwest Madison Street between Southwest 10th Avenue and Southwest Park Avenue for the Rothko Pavilion at Portland Art Museum. Colleagues, before we begin today's session, uh, Commissioner Udaley has been previously excused from this session. She asked if we could start the session by having her Chief of Staff, Marshal Runkle, read a statement into the record. Steve, you can stay there. You just yeah, uh, Mr. Janik, stay right there. You can just slide that mic right over. And Marshal, if you could just slide the mic over. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, for the record, I'm Marshal Runkle. I'm the Chief of Staff for Commissioner Udaley. So I'm going to read this in the first person, but I'm, it's Chloe speaking. <laughs> uh, I apologize that I could not attend the hearing today. I'm in Washington, D.C. on city business. I will listen to the entire hearing before voting on this issue next week. I supported introducing this measure because it provides a pathway forward for the Portland Art Museum's proposed addition. To be clear, the City Council is not considering a specific development proposal today. It is simply amending the terms of a previously granted street vacation. The alterations to the terms of the vacation that are being considered today will preserve public access through the vacated area during the hours that our previous City Council set, 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. Bike riding is not allowed on sidewalks in most of downtown. So the amendment will not affect access currently allowed by bicyclists. If the amendment is approved, people with bicycles and pets will still be welcome to travel through the area. If this amendment to the vacation is approved, it will enable the Portland Art Museum to submit a formal development proposal. The proposal will be subject to a detailed technical analysis and will offer opportunities for public consideration and input. In addition to that process, I've asked the Portland Art Museum to consult with the Commission on Disability about its proposal to make the buildings as welcoming and accessible as possible. I'm a strong believer in the principles of universal design, designing buildings to be accessible and inclusive to the full spectrum of abilities benefits all users. If the City Council approves this amendment to the street vacation, all commit to working with city staff, the Portland Art Museum, the Portland Commission on Disability, and the public to ensure that the needs of our entire community are thoroughly considered during the development review process. Thank you, Marshall, we appreciate it. Thank you. Colleagues, the Portland Art Museum has a long history of providing access to arts and culture and acts as a regional hub for our community. As uh, many of you know, I have not been shy about saying I am very excited about this opportunity to expand the museum and provide better access. I want to thank the Portland Art Museum for taking the time to uh, thoughtfully respond to the testimony that was received previously, and I understand you're going to be sharing some of the results of uh, your efforts today, and I want you uh, to uh, understand that I am grateful for the additional time that you took to find compromises and react to that testimony. I'm particularly pleased that ADA access can be made much better than it currently is and that you've agreed to extend the hours to ensure that the community can still use the existing public easement. Uh, with that, I'd like to pass this on to Commissioner Saltzman. <coughs> Commissioner? Uh, thank you, Mayor. And thank you to everyone who is here today on this <coughs> important item. As we all know, the Portland Art Museum is engaged in an effort to stitch their two buildings together and create a much more accessible art viewing experience for the public. And to that end, they need clarity from the city on whether they can enclose the eight foot easement currently in place between their two buildings. The ordinance before us today 
does that. In April, when I first brought this item to council, I was clear with the museum that it would be controversial and cause concern about access from many members of the public. And that did indeed come to fruition. And I pulled the item back to my office as support for the idea was, was tepid at best. In the ensuing months, the museum has done a great job of taking what they heard at that April hearing, as well as listening and reaching out to members of the public, and have come forward with an amended proposal that includes extended hours of operation for the uh, Rothko Pavilion from 7 a.m. to 11 p.m., seven days a week. And the museum is also clear that all members of the public are free to access the easement, regardless if they are walking <coughs> their dog or walking their bike. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to the museum uh, and let them give us a, a brief overview of the plans. Uh, we do have, uh, at council's disposal, we have Caitlin Ruff from PBOT, Portland Bureau of Transportation, to answer questions, and also Matt Grum from my office as well. And uh, without further ado, we can turn it over to the museum. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mayor Wheeler, uh, city councilors, I'm Pat Ritz, and I am the current chairman of the board of trustees. Pat, can you hold up for one moment? Great one. Uh, I'm not sure we're coming through there. Great one. One more down. Great. Yeah, right there. Thank you. And just move oh, a little okay. closer. I got it. Yeah, if you wouldn't mind starting over so we can get the closed captioning. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, Pat, your time is up, but thank you for being here. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, counselors, I'm Pat Ritz, and I am chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Portland Art Museum. Uh, I have been, and my family has been involved in the Art Museum since day one, 1892. Now, I'm not that old, but my ancestors were around in those days. Uh, one of them was one of the citizens of Portland that uh, started the Portland Art Association, as its previous name was, in 1892. My grandmother's sister, Henrietta Failing, was the first director of the museum in its first 16 years. Uh, many of my relatives have served on the board uh, much of the <coughs> family wealth uh, resides within its walls. Uh, I tell my kids that if they want to get a, a touch and a flavor of the wealth of the failings, go to the Portland Art Museum and observe some of the 700 objects. Uh, I will say that uh, my parents always told us that set of lawn furniture in the backyard is what they got out of the failing estates. Uh, in, uh, in the period between uh, uh, 1932 and 1970, as the art museum grew from 22 paintings and 133 graphic uh, arts uh, to, to thousands, uh, the museum had to be expanded. Uh, it was expanded in 1932, 1938, and 1970 to house not only a growing collection and growing services, but also an expanding art school. I came on the board in 1994, and during my tenure on the board, we have done already done three major renovations. One dealt with uh, uh, redoing the space that the art school, which was then known as the Portland, uh, or the uh, Pacific Northwest College of <coughs> Art when it, when it separated from the museum in 1994. So we did a major expansion then. We uh, also, uh, in the early 90s, acquired the Masonic Temple. And in the early 2000s, it became necessary to expand the museum into that space as we had outgrown room for administration and also gallery space. And that uh, project was completed in 2005. Uh, so here we are in uh, 2017, and we have some of the 
same issues that have dogged us uh, over the last 25 years, and that is uh, our collections keep growing, our attendance, which this year will be 350,000 people, including the uh, highest monthly uh, number of 50,000 in November, and of the 350,000, fully 100,000 of those are children, which, by the way, uh, if they're under 18, they are able to come to the museum free at any time. Uh, but again, we keep acquiring works of art. People keep donating works of art. We now have 50,000 art objects uh, in, at the museum. And so uh, there's a, always an ongoing need for more gallery space. And as I know full well, because I participated in the committees that both worked on the funding and the design of these, uh, these expansions, we were never able to get enough money to do what we really needed to do. And so what we're talking about now is a, a, lot, of, a lot of things in, in, in connection with doing things right that we didn't necessarily do right the last time around. The problem with the connectivity and accessibility is a big part of what we're talking about today. And Brian will go into the, go into the details. Uh, you know, in closing, just a couple items. Uh, you know, this is a town that uh, is trying to build its business reputation in the creative industries. And if you're going to be uh, a town that professes that, having a viable uh, art museum for the education of its people and uh, to support the, the creative arts, which these days are of multiple ex expansions. The days of just uh, oils on canvas are, are behind us. It's many more things. Uh, it fits. This is a tremendous economic engine for the city of Portland. And it's almost entirely funded by private donations. So uh, I'd like to turn this over. Thank you for listening and to Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioners. I'm pleased to update you today. And I'm so appreciative of your leadership, Commissioner Saltzman, in helping us move this forward. I'm also appreciative of all those in attendance. It, it's a good sign that people care about their art museum and this cultural community that we live. I'm excited by that. I'd like to show uh, some slides, and if they work, there it is, okay, thank you. This is a picture of the Newark Museum in Newark, New Jersey, founded in 1909. It was the museum that gave me my first opportunity to be part of the museum community. I was an intern here, and it eventually led to a job. What this experience taught me is the importance of the role of an art museum in providing a community with hope and aspiration. This museum in Newark provides an incredible uh, anchor for this city, a city that's gone through great turmoil. So when I looked at this opportunity in 2006 to come to Portland, I saw an institution based downtown, integrated within the community, and a museum that had so much potential to generate and gain community access. That was so important to me. And some of the first things we did when I arrived was make sure that children 17 and under are free. We made sure that programs are connecting with a diverse community. In this situation, we can see our partnership with Portland State, the Middle East program there. We've also been making sure that the museum has images and works of art on the wall that reflect the changing demographics of our community and provide further insight into the great world in which we live and the creative energy. I think moving forward, the next thing in our vision, and I think this is working pretty well, it's working okay? Okay. It, our, the next aspect of our vision is to make sure that our facilities reflect the expansion of access that we've created previously programmatically and also with admission policies. So we've been working to find a solution for physical accessibility issues within this museum for a number of years. We're seeking now approval with a solution that will make access to and throughout the museum better for everyone of all ages and abilities, including those with disabilities. 
just to reflect briefly, and I think, Mayor, you touched on this, and Commissioner Saltzman, you did as well. In 1968, the city of Portland vacated the street between Southwest Madison and Southwest, uh, Madison Street between Southwest Park and 10th Avenue. That vacation had multiple, a few um, requirements, an eight foot wide easement to be illuminated, area was to be used as an open mall, and ownership was to be transferred to adjacent properties. In 1984, as you noted already, the ordinance was amended to allow the museum to close off the area between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. I could just insert for a moment that it actually said that it's an, um, a pedestrian sculpture mall for the display of outdoor sculptures, so it's more than just an open mall. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to reflect and just show you what we have now at our museum. If you entered or tried to uh, enter the museum at this stage, this is the 1932 building designed by Pietro Belusky and you're faced with significant challenges if you have any disability. If you do find the access ramp to the right of the institution's main entrance, you would find it perhaps hidden behind multiple stairs as well as this grade change. If you enter the museum, the access is very difficult, as been noted. But these are just some recent pictures. This is a picture of our two buildings being connected in 1970, and you can see the various stairs. Just last month, we had someone in a mobile device come around this corner and almost went down those stairs, which was quite scary. If you find your way into the Mark Building or the Jubit Center, you're faced with a number of stairs, as you can see here. This is our invitation, and I say invitation somewhat um, uh, sarcastically because I don't think it's a very inviting experience to go see some of the great masters that we have in our collection. This is the underground passageway to the Mark Building or the Jubit Center. If you find your way to the Jubit Center and the Mark Building, you're faced with a number of stairs throughout as evidenced by these images. So when we looked at this several years ago and we were thinking about making sure accessibility across the campus and throughout the uh, museum was uh, successful, we had this brief analysis. And this is where we started our plans and I think this is really telling. This is where the architects and the internal team looked at. We saw the Belusky building which was designed in 1932 and 39, attached to a school in 1970 in yellow and going across to the Mark building which was built in 1927, although renovated in 2005. The orange line going from south to north is really the only connection across the campus. And you see the vertical red lines between the main buildings and also in the Jubit Center, which show the barriers. And those bar barriers are distinguished by stairs as well as elevation changes throughout the campus. So the goal has always been very clearly, how do we do this? How do we connect across multiple levels? The architects that we work with initially came up with this very brilliant idea that if we can raise the, the main level floor of the Jubit's wing four feet, we would have one ground level floor throughout the campus that would be of one, um, one dimension. It would, it would be consistent throughout the campus and this was a very important aspect of this plan. Also, if we were able to connect through these designs, we would also have one new accessible connection that links the second floor galleries improving wayfinding and visitor experience throughout the building. Another very important aspect of this project is visible elevators. To easily access, access elevators from the entry pavilion that connect all floors and you can see them here. So if you entered, if we were able to create a ground floor structure at the location that we're proposing, when you entered, if you looked left, you could see an elevator, and if you looked right, you can see an ele elevator. It's a very important component of what we're proposing here, because right now, if you enter the museum, there's no sense of vertical circulation. Also, we've always been very cognizant, and we want to make sure we continue to be very respectful of the ordinance that is, or the easement that's currently in place to allow access throughout the space. So right now, we just have a general idea, an envelope of a building, but are committed to certainly keeping access throughout that space, going from the park blocks westward. 
We're very excited about some of the initial designs and ideas because as we know, the streetcar stops at our museum to the west. This is very exciting for us. And right now, we really want to create an invitation to move into the space, ground floor, one consistent floor plane into the museum as well as into the park. This is very important. And an invitation to the west side of the museum. And that, that the ability to perhaps energize that part of our campus and that part of the city is really exciting for us right now. This could be an entry also coming from the park block, so we would have two entries, east side and west side. These images are just concept drawings and these will certainly evolve if we move forward, if we're given the opportunity to continue to have conversations with the community to make sure it meets the community's needs. This is what a space could look like inside, again, as I indicated, by having one consistent floor plane, our museum is transformed throughout, our campus is transformed. This would be a space that people can go north, south, east, west, all free of charge. Ultimately, this is our goal. One of the things that I think we, we weren't able to communicate last time was to show this image in particular. This is a very extensive project. It starts with the loading dock on the left and a new gallery, transferring all the way into new restrooms. You can see right now there are no, new, there are no restrooms on the first floor of the institution. Going into the pavilion that we're proposing, which would have a community commons, an education center, outdoor space, also moving deeper into the Mark building, creating new gallery space, as well as a new library, which would be moved down to the first floor, more accessible. So it's a very big project. It's a project that reimagines the entire institution. Ultimately, these are some of the goals moving from south to north across the campus, as well as I mentioned, vertical transportation, visible stairs, visible elevators, to make sure if you entered the facility, you could see how to go across and up and down. This is also important. This is an image that would be a transformed library, perhaps. I show this image because right now, if you go into the Mark building in the public galleries, there are no restrooms. By transforming this space into gallery space, we now have accessible restrooms for this entire wing, which is very significant for a number of reasons. Since our last City Hall presentation, we heard some excellent feedback. I'm so pleased about people speaking up, giving us their thoughts, and I think it's very important for us as a museum committed to the public good to hear that. Um, we are listening and we continue to listen, but right now we have proposed initially to the city that we would remain open from 7 a.m. to p.m. I must add a little edit there, however. We've heard some additional comments from the community and I think it would be really exciting for us to align our hours being open in this space to the streetcar hours. So perhaps even expanding those hours, I think that would be significant. And supporting the city's efforts to make sure that public transportation maintains a foundation in our city and we want to be part of that. We would add security and lighting to enhance the safety of the interior and exterior spaces. We would allow pets and bikes to go through, again, very much part of the fabric of our city and very much important to making sure this museum is ingrained in the fabric of the city. We're working with accessibility and inclusive design advisors to make this one of the most accessible institutions we feel on the West Coast, if not the United States. That's very important to us. Thank you. So I have a question. because Yes. And I think I want to state at the outset that everybody loves the art museum. I haven't read a single thing or heard a single thing from anybody who said, this is a terrible institution, it should just go away. So that, that said, <laughs> Thank could you. you go back to the, picture, to the image with the streetcar and the one before that, please? So why, I understand about the elevators on either side. Mm -hmm. Why can't you keep the bottom, the plaza as is and have the entry because you're going to be doing a lot of removing of steps obviously for the, all of the accessibility reasons you mentioned which we all support as well. Why can you not have those people being able to enter the art museum from either side which would then keep the um, Madison Street area open and free? Great question. We really want the floor plane to be flat across the space. We also feel that it's really important to be able to move the loading dock and also provide entry space for a lot of our school children, among others, and enclosed space is, is really important to that. But you could do that with having the level of the, that floor 
you, you said you're going to be elevating one of its four, one side four feet. Yes. So that doesn't really answer my question. Why could you not have the, um, the plaza and then entries to either side clearly showing the elevators? Right. So again, I, I'm not sure completely of the question, but as I think I understand it, we want a central entryway and a space that's enclosed to make sure people can navigate and use our facilities um, in that space as they enter. <coughs> Even if the counter to that is that then it looks like your space rather than everybody's space. Um, I, I think our goal is always to serve the public and now having this free, I think our goal is to make sure like other museums across the country have public spaces, either exterior or interior that can be used for various programs. I have a question if I could. Um, so I, um, as someone who comes to the museum a lot, I have always found the current entrance very confusing. And, the, and I, I am an able-bodied person, but still trying to navigate downstairs, coming up, coming around, and the like. Um, it, it did seem like a, a particular defect of the, of, the, of the vision for the Mark building, uh, the, the lack of connectivity. I, I can't imagine if someone had some a disability or impairment that they also had to navigate. <clears throat> We've been working, Brian, on upgrading all of our restrooms <coughs> at the city level, and I've gotten a crash course in restrooms. I sort of took the mantle <laughs> from Commissioner Leonard, who did the loo, and now we're doing restrooms. And we're looking at accessibility. We're looking at things like making sure there's a changing area. Yep. And by the way, uh, not just a changing area for a child, but um, I have a colleague, for example, that has an adult um, child. And, a, and as an adult um, you know, child that, um, that requires a changing area. And so there are some particular design accommodations. Um, I assume that as part of your accessibility vision that will translate to the restrooms and you'd be open to some feedback from our commission and other advocates about how to make those restrooms as ac accessible as possible? Yes, um, a number of the restrooms will be new, so it gives us a great opportunity to create up-to-date spaces for the needs of our community at this stage. And I think that's exciting. And then the older ones, we would certainly look at retrofitting because again, as the project's quite extensive, it would give us resources to make sure that happens. Again, just, just a, an anecdotal thing, but you know, we have in a couple of our restrooms, just a tiny little space where a parent can put a child and change a diaper, which does nothing for that parent if they have an adult child in a wheelchair. Yep. that needs some privacy, and that, that's, that, that requires a screen and a, and a larger space. So if this thing does move forward, we would look forward to uh, sharing some of what we've learned about accessible restrooms. Well, I think that's, that's the beauty of this discussion now. I think the museum can learn a lot through this conversation and the feedback from the committees that the city has and some of the insight they have. That would be very important. Thank you. So before we uh, move to public testimony, I would like to offer an amendment that would uh, match the hours of operation of the pavilion to those of the Portland streetcar, hmm. uh, as was just suggested by uh, the director. Uh, let me give those to you, and I'll read the amendment out loud. Uh, so it reads, the uh, pavilion will provide, will continue to provide ground level public access and connectivity between Southwest Park and 10th Avenues between the weekday hours of 5.30 a.m to 12 a.m., Saturday hours of 7 a.m. to 12 a.m., and Sunday hours of 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. 11 p.m. 11 p.m., excuse me. Uh, access will not be blocked in any manner <coughs> and will be adequately illuminated for use in hours of darkness. So I'll second that. Okay. So we have a motion. We, have a, we have a second. Well, I actually also had a motion on that, so it, maybe you could accept a friendly amendment that it would be 365 days a year. Okay. Thank you. What's the, um, currently I thought the proposal was seven days a week, so what is that, what is 360? It means that it's, even when the museum is closed that the easement has to be open. The access needs to be yes. open. Was that not the original proposal? Yes, that is. So um, we're proposing seven days a week 
for those hours. So could you just say 365 days a year 365 as well? days a year, yes. Thank you. So, so somebody who uh, follows the movement of the sun and the moon will note that we've just created a loophole. If we say 365, why don't we just say year-round? Yeah, there you go. Year-round. Very good. <laughs> year One day round. a follow you round. can close this up. And I, I assume the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, commissioner no. who made the motion and the commissioner who made the second are okay with can we, those. Can yes. we yes. just check with our esteemed council for a second? Uh, so, uh, commissioner, is that an amendment then to uh, section one finding number seven? Just a point of clarification. Either that or what I was suggesting to the directors under A. Yeah, it's my, my amendment is a replacement for number seven in the ordinance. Okay. That's in the findings though. We need a, something in the uh, directions. So I think it's a change to A in the directions. So I'm hearing Commissioner Fritz say that she would like that amendment to be both to finding seven and also additional language to be included in directive A sub A. Thank you, Ben, that's, okay. very, that's correct. Thank you. That sounds like sounds good, yeah. yeah. Commissioner so, Saltzman, at your discretion, we can either call the roll on this now or keep it open until after testimony. Uh, why don't we keep it open until after testimony? Very good. Um, I'm the last presenter on behalf of the Art Museum. I'm Steve Janik, an, an attorney at 101 Southwest Maine. Uh, I have just some brief comments to offer you to put an appropriate legal framework around the decision in front of you. In the public uh, discussion about this, there has been some a suggestion that there are some legal policies that may be at issue. So my purpose here is to try to clarify that for you. Um, this is not a land use hearing. Uh, it, it is a hearing simply amending a condition of the original street vacation ordinance passed in 1968. The effect of that ordinance was to make the land in question privately owned, subject to an easement in favor of the city. It is no longer public right of way, even though some writers have stated that uh, this action today would do what was already done in 1968. Accordingly, the city council has unfettered discretion to amend that ordinance uh, as requested by the art museum and as amended by the council. If this was a land use decision, State law would establish and require that you follow several requirements, such as in advance of the hearing, mailed notices to people within so many feet, a specific statement at the beginning of this hearing of the applicable land use criteria, a staff report delivered a number of days in advance. None of those things have happened, correctly so, because this is not a land use proceeding. Nonetheless, some have raised concerns based on a few policies in the June 2017 recommended draft of the central city portion of the draft 2035 comprehensive plan. And I want to address those. Um, <clears throat> first, it's important to note that the new central city plan is not yet legally effective. It won't be until it's been finally adopted by the council and subsequently acknowledged by the Land Conservation and Development Commission. Uh, just the other day, the staff uh, acknowledge that, but it takes a, a final order of the commission under state law. So none of that has happened. But nonetheless, I want to address the policies that some have raised. Uh, a couple of these were raised by Commissioner Fritz's office just recently. One of them is policy 3.6, street diversity, and I'm quoting it. Differentiate the character of key streets to offer a diversity of urban experiences and connections reflect the character of unique districts, and expand open space and create functions in the right of way where possible. So this policy simply doesn't deal with activities that occur on private land. Rather, it's directed to opportunities that may be illuminated in the future to deal with public rights of way. While it is inapplicable, parts of it, quote, such as unique districts, like the cultural district, and expanding, quote, recreational functions like a pavilion of art, <clears throat> all of which are consistent with this art museum proposal. The second policy that's been raised is policy 5.8. And again, I'm quoting, enhance the character and function of the public realm 
through design standards, guidelines, amenities, and land uses that activate the pedestrian environment and encourage community gathering. Again, nothing here applies to private property. It addresses the public realm. In addition, the policy is specifically directed to design standards and guidelines and not to any current or proposed regulations. But again, within this policy, it does talk about promoting amenities and land uses that encourage community gathering, such as a clean, well-lit, accessible public space that will be created within the pavilion. There's one or two other policies that are worth noting. Uh, some have commented on these. Policy 5.10, this deals with streets, and it proposes a street hierarchy and a development character for certain streets, and it establishes three categories of streets, one of which is called flexible. The definition in the policy of flexible means Due to their flexible character of these connections, the ground floor responses of adjacent buildings varies considerably. Now, what does all that mean? On page 93 of the urban design concept diagram that shows the area we're talking about today, the easement itself, and it characterizes that as a pathway of flexible character meaning its relationship to the adjacent buildings is important. That would certainly allow and even encourage the pavilion, given its relationship to the two other art museum buildings while maintaining that pathway as it is today, but simply enclosed. Uh, if you read the entire document, uh, you will find nowhere the assertion in the Sunday letter to the editor claiming that the plan specifically refers to this easement area as a, quote, potential new open space. In the hierarchy of land use regulations, as we all know, the zoning code is to implement the admittedly and appropriately ambiguous policy statements in the plan. So if you take a look at the companion new zoning code that goes along with this framework plan, there is nothing in the new code that would prohibit or limit the proposed pavilion. In more detail, the new code does not change the allowed use, does not change the floored area ratio, nor does it change the height. Those are all the same as they are today. So finally, again, this is not a land use case. If it were, there are no policies that directly address this site and no policies that would logically prohibit the pavilion. There are no legally effective policies or land use regulations today to apply. And again, the decision to modify the street vacation ordinance is entirely within your discretion and fettered by those claim policies. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Thank yeah, you. you. Uh, maybe for the city attorney, maybe for Commissioner Fish. It says in the findings that we no longer need a uh, easement for utilities. Number nine of the findings says that we did have a blanket easement for utilities, and it says the city has no present or future need to locate public facilities in this area. Are we certain that there aren't any utilities, sewers, whatever, underneath the street there? To our knowledge, there are none. Okay, so do we need to move that over into the findings, to the directions as well? Yeah, or we have, if, we have if, no objection to that. Just something to think about. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Uh, so, Carla, how many people do we have currently signed up for public testimony? Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. 66. All right, so, uh, folks, we have a lot of people signed up. Two minutes. It would be really helpful um, if I don't have to stop people. I don't like doing that because I assume everybody is here because they wish to be heard. Um, so I'm going to ask you to be as concise as possible. Uh, the way it works is if you just state your name for the record, you do not need to tell us your address. That's not necessary. If you are a lobbyist, we do need to know that per council rules. And uh, we ask everybody to please be respectful of people's opinion. 
Um, it is a rare day when everybody agrees with everything that is said at these microphones, so assume you will probably hear some views that are different than your own. Uh, that's good. That's what we want in a chamber like this. So please, no shouting, uh, no interrupting <coughs> of people's <coughs> testimony or the council deliberations. Uh, we don't want to have to ask anybody to leave, and I, I don't anticipate that will be the case. Um, so come on up, name for the record, two minutes. The yellow light will start flashing and there'll be a beep when you have about 30 seconds left. And when your time is up, uh, the red light starts flashing and when you get about 30 seconds over, your chair electrifies. Um, <laughs> if you wish to sign up and you have not done so, you can still do that with Carla here uh, at the front, or the sign up's still outside, Carla. I've got it here. They're right here by Carla's desk if you'd like to sign up and you haven't had a chance to do so yet. Traditionally, we offer uh, folks who have little kids or disabilities or other special needs to please uh, work your way to the front and Carla will accommodate you quickly at the front of the pack. Otherwise, she'll just call out people's uh, names as they signed up. Okay. So if there's anybody who has a special needs who'd like to come up now, please come on. Hello. Hi, how are you today? Which way do I go? Very good. Okay. And then we'll go with the first two it people. Moves. I got it. Okay. Are Tom Nelson and Wendy Rom. And the table. right in front of you. And they'll be followed by Walt Wexler, Wexler, Suzanne Leonard, and Robert Wright. Mayor, I just want to observe that I Fisher think there's, Fisher. I think Wendy should get some kind of award. Uh, she got here at 5.30 this morning, camped out, <laughs> so she could be among the first three. Not and quite so, that bad, actually. Very... <laughs> I got daily emails from the museum actually, I saying believe... earlier and earlier and earlier, so I thought, oh my. Well, I'd we, like at some point for us to go to a system where you can come early and just get a number so we don't make people stand in line. It would be wonderful. It seems to me we could do that <laughs> and then allow you to go for two hours to, to go get a meal or something and keep your place. I hope that's something we could consider. You know, that, that's great. Or alternatively, we could at least provide pancakes. <laughs> I'll take very, both. Very good. So uh, would you like to go first, please? All the me? way at the end. Yes, please. Thank okay. you. Um, hello, commissioners and mayor. I, am, I don't know if you recognize me. I am a member of the Portland uh, Commission on Disability. However, today I'm here to represent myself. Um, I'm very excited um, and pleased to hear all, of all of the um, possible improvements that the um, art museum is proposing. Um, I am wondering, I heard a lot about uh, physical adjustments um, and accessibility um, measures of in, in this proposal. I am wondering how much um, has been considered for people who are visually impaired um, and blind. This, this pavilion has been open and if I'm walking up to this pavilion to try to cross, and there's a building there now, what am I going to do? Um, I would not know. I would not see the signs that say welcome. I would not see through the glass. This is a barrier. This is a physical barrier um, that was not there before. And um, the, uh, I feel like the, all the, all the, um, all the proposed um, changes are very, very good, and I am very excited to speak to you guys about that more tomorrow in our meeting in PCOD. Um, I would like to um, discuss more about the access from a blind person's perspective. Um, also, if this was closed in, imagine, I'm imagining there's going to be a lot of people milling around in this area. If I do happen to find the door that was not there before and go in. It's very difficult for a person with a blind that's blind and vision impaired to get through crowds. So there's going to be there's going to have to be something that's going to help me get through this crowds or these people or even even the art sculptures. Um, one last question I have is the timing of this proposal and all these accessibility um, suggestions, these seem to be coming and I just hope that it's not being proposed on the backs of people with disabilities. Did you, was this ever considered, all these accessibility changes, were they ever considered before this pavilion is, was wanted? 
Gupta. Very good. Thank you. And before you leave, could you just state your name for the record? We didn't get it for the record. Oh. Sorry, my name is Angel Ray. Very good. And Angel, uh, I don't want to slow this down because there's like still 67 good people testimony. who want to testify. Uh, thank you for your testimony, and I think it is completely an excellent suggestion that you've raised with regard to the design phase of this. So thank you for making the effort to be here today. Good afternoon. Good thank afternoon. You. I'm Wendy Rom. Oh, you're next. Sorry. That's all right. That's I mean, they well, just well, they, you go ahead. <laughs> my name is Tom Nielsen. My wife and I are strong advocates and patron level supporters <coughs> of the art museum. We also live across the street from the museum and are keenly aware how important keeping the public passageway across the plaza is. Almost two years ago, in April of 2016, I had the opportunity to attend a presentation by the art museum of the Rothko Pavilion project. The plan today is essentially identical to the plan that was presented two years ago. At that meeting and two, two years ago, and during at least three following presentations with Pam, I, along with others, reinforced how important keeping the public passageway open was and asking that they go back to their Chicago architect and have them develop a plan B concept that would keep at least an eight foot wide passageway across the plaza as spelled out in the current easement. Creatively solving a plan B solution is very doable, but the museum never listened or took the request seriously. There has been no indication that the Chicago or any other architects have been challenged to develop a plan B concept. Now we are to believe they are listening and that they have decided to allow the public passageway through the glass pavilion between the 7 to 11 p.m. every day, including bicycles and animals. This means instead of staffing the 48 museum hours, open hours per week, the pavilion would need to be staffed 116 hours per week. By simple calculations, assuming two staff would be needed to secure the pavilion and using a very conservative hourly burden rate, keeping the pavilion open as a passageway will cost the museum well over $200,000 per year. Once the glass wall is built across the plaza, how long will it be before the museum comes back claiming hardship and requesting easement revisions because assuming the potential issues of related, relating to animals, bicycles, and passers through can all be contained and managed, the added expense of securing the pavilion during the extra easement hours will be much greater than presented. I want to support the project but cannot in its current form. I still believe there is a plan B design that would solve the issues and be less burdensome on the public and the museum. The council should require the museum to pursue an alternative design before approving this project. But if the, if the council were to, wanted to move ahead and approve it today, they should not approve it without reconfirming the easement conditions and making them permanent and requiring a significant level of public education and signage. Very good, thank you, good afternoon. Hi, I'll try again. Uh, I'm Wendy Rahm. Uh, I'm a museum donor and supporter. I support the museum's interior concepts and upper floor connections between the buildings, but I do not support the ground floor concept, especially the taking of a public easement without having had an open public process with nearby residents. The museum has listened but not heard calls for a sky bridge to save the passage. Boxes have been checked, that's all. So-called concessions of hours and so forth are red herrings, a distraction away from the ground floor public easement. If council decides today to accept these ordinance changes, it will be a giveaway. It will subvert your constituents by gifting the museum negotiating advantage in future discussions of the ground floor passage. The process has been both rushed and flawed. Even the museum's lobbying firm adver advised having a stakeholders committee, which should have happened long before coming to today's public hearing. Afterwards is pointless since the giveaway will be done. The cart is in front of the horse. And contrary to assertions of improving co accommodations for those in the disabled community, a trip from Park to 10th will be severely degraded. Today from Park to 10th, the passage has no obstruction, is nearly flat, easy to push a wheelchair. Instead, the proposal forces all to mount a ramp or stairs, pass through one door, through an enclosed lobby with guards, through another door, before continuing to the streetcar stop on 10th. The degradation is confirmed by Matthew Denny and Bob Junpoth, disability rights lawyers. 
At least recognize that when you cast your vote. Finally, this taking is contrary to the Central City 2035 and Comp Plan's walkability goals that you've approved. The two Madison easements are mapped as key pedestrian ways in the Central City Plan. The Oregonian quoted one commissioner saying, I'm tired of setting goals and then falling short. So are we. After spending years on Central City and Comp Plans, why disregard the conclusions so quickly? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Next three, please. Uh, we've had a request for uh, someone to come up first. Please, yeah. And then we'll go with Walt Wexler and Suzanne Leonard. And after them will be Robert Wright, Dan Berksvick, and Judith Marks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Would you mind starting, please? Me? Yes, please. Thank you. Mary Luce. I'm a resident of 12th and Jefferson. Um, I oppose the ordinance changes. Um, well, I agree with Wendy's testimony. Um, yeah, because if you know, if that whole block were closed off, it would make it harder for people to get around. And well, I've lived here since 72, and we've always been allowed to uh, walk through that space without it <coughs> being considered a trespass. And I worry that it's it's too much change. Um, I wouldn't mind, uh, like the the floor, um, the ground, the sidewalk level of it, staying and and putting a sky a sky bridge above it, which I heard was in the plans. I wouldn't oppose that, but uh, closing the bottom as Wendy described is um, would put difficulties up to a lot of people, and I don't know what my time is doing. But About thirty-nine seconds. Oh, okay. Well, I I'll stop now. But thank you for your time. Thank you for coming in. We appreciate it. Appreciate Good it. afternoon. Go. You're next. Go. Okay. Suzanne Lenard, Mayor, Commissioners. I do not object to the museum building a link at the second, third, and fourth floors if the street level passage through is hospitably designed and kept open. However, I strongly urge City Council not to change the wording of the ordinance that requires Madison Avenue from the parks to 10th Avenue to not be blocked in any manner and to not be used for any purpose other than an open mall. This wording ensures that those of us living on the east side, I live in the ambassador, elders, people in wheelchairs, people with strollers, and all those with mobility challenges can easily access the streetcar stop, our friends, restaurants, and businesses west of the museum. Portland is renowned as a unique city of small 200 by 200 blocks. This is what makes the city walkable. The streets belong to all the people. It's the responsibility of city government to protect this valuable public heritage and not give it away for private profit. This taking of the common wealth needs to stop. If you allow the wording of the ordinance to be changed, the museum could, at a later date, decide to close the passageway entirely. For this reason, I strongly urge you not to change the wording of the ordinance that requires this passageway to not be blocked in any manner, and to not be used for any purpose other than an open mall. Thank you for caring about the well-being of your constituents and protecting the public right of way. Thank Suzanne, you. I, I'm just compelled to ask one quick question, because you're the second person now who has implied either bad faith or that there's a potential bait and switch going on. And so I just want to better understand that, because 
The proposal before the council is that we change an easement. That easement can't, could not be changed subsequently without council approval. So what's the basis of your concern that, that the art museum could unilaterally close the passageway in violation of whatever action the council takes? Well, I'm asking you not to change the wording that's no, I understand said. that, but, but okay. you've, you've raised the specter of them closing the passage entirely. You're the second person who's done so. So I just want to better understand what, what's the foundation of your concern that they can take an action contrary to what council has directed? No, I'm concerned that you do not allow this particular wording to change in the ordinance because that's what maintains it as open okay. for the public. Thank you. Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen of the City Council, thank you very much for your time, your energy, and your service. It is appreciated. Glad to be here. I'm Walter Weiler, condominium owner and resident uh, in the Portland Art Museum neighborhood. <coughs> I live in the Elliott. I urge you to approve the ordinance matter before you, however, with the provision that the design, the resulting design of the Rothko Pavilion, include an unblocked open pedestrian easement that is a walkway with no doors. The original 1968 ordinance required pedestrian easement not to be blocked and that it be open. This ordinance was an early realization of Portland's determination to be a pedestrian friendly city. Retreating from these standards would be a regrettable loss. If the Rothko Pavilion includes a walkway with doors, it may well leave a long-term resentment in the neighborhood. However, if an open walkway is included without doors, I predict the project will sustain a groundswell of neighborhood support. That's my one minute story and I'm sticking to it. Very good, sir, thank you. We appreciate it, all three of you. Next three, please. Next three are Robert Wright, Dan Berksvick, and Judith B. Marks. Good afternoon, sir. Why don't you start, please? Yeah, I'm Robert Wright. I live in the West End in the Elliott Tower. Mayor Wheeler, commissioners, good afternoon. <coughs> Stewardship of public property for the common good is your fundamental responsibility as elected officials. Stewardship of a vacated block of Southwest Madison Street was demonstrated in 1968 and again in 1984 by city councils at the time. The street was lightly used by cars, but its sidewalks were very much used by pedestrians. The ordinance ensured pedestrian passage through an open mall, an extension of the South Park blocks. The proposed pavilion provides much needed above ground connection of the museum's two main buildings. However, its ground level design is restrictive, enclosing a space intended to remain an open mall, both in fact and appearance. Stewardship is again needed for what was once a public street. The needs and desires of an iconic, private, wealthy institution must be balanced with the needs and expectations of the public. There is a balanced solution, but the approval process is backwards. Changing an ordinance should come last based on approved design. The art museum seems to be saying, change the ordinance, then trust us to work out the details. An open mall is much more than a detail. First, do not consider changing the ordinance until formal reports on the design received from city bureaus, departments, commissions, and a stakeholders advisory group. Second, request the art museum also submit a revised alternative design, one without an enclosed ground level with building entry doors as are now used now, but in every other aspect the same. With elevators in both buildings and glass walled overarching connecting spans, accessibility for people of all ages will be improved as intended. Why a walled ground floor is needed is certainly not clear. If the mall is enclosed with hand open doors for public passage, the pavilion will eventually appear to be a completely private space where the public is allowed to pass through, not an open mall where pedestrian access and passage is guaranteed by right. Your stewardship will be precedent setting. What public space will be next? Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mayor Wheeler, commissioners, my name is Dan Bergsvik. My husband and I are members of the Art Museum and I'm speaking in favor of the proposal. 
Um, you've all been to the museum. You know that from the outside, it's not very welcoming. Um, if you're a person with mobility issues, like my husband over there, um, who now has arthritis, it can be a challenge. Uh, when you manage to find your way inside and get through admissions, you're immediately confronted with stairways. Given the chopped up floor plan, it isn't clear which way you ought to go. If you'd like to see the Impressionists or the modern and contemporary galleries, good luck. The museum estimates that upwards of half of their attendees never make it into the Mark Building. Um, if, to get there, you have to go down the stairs, down the hall, down another flight of stairs, down a longer hall, up two flights of stairs, and then you're back where you started on the first floor. And then there are more stairs to get to the galleries where you'd like to go. The proposed pavilion would address these problems. As it stands, the museum is two big brick boxes with no windows, not particularly inviting. The pavilion would allow passersby on Park and 10th to see into the museum and see what's going on. It will be a picture window inviting you inside. My, my own feeling is that it's somewhat like the Apple Store downtown, which is clear, you can see what's happening, it draws you in. Um, best of all, the interior layout will be more coherent and you'll be able to move between the two buildings without changing floors and there'll be more bathrooms, which is a plus. Um, it has been suggested the museum build a sky bridge between the buildings instead. To my mind, that just replaces one maze with another. A maze with a view, but still an impediment. Plus, without the new pavilion, the problem of overcrowded access would remain. The current entrances are cramped and inefficient. The pavilion will provide a spacious, easily accessible entry. Besides more room for admissions, it'll be a meeting place for docent tours, for film festival attendees, or school groups. Currently, they all jostle for space in the confined courtyard entrance. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Judith Marks, and I'm an art museum member. I wholeheartedly support the art museum's plan to make the inside of the buildings barrier free. Leveling the upper floors and linking them will make visits more convenient. But I still have strong reservations about closing Madison. I chose my residence after reviewing the city's future plans with the idea that my deteriorating breathing would best be managed by living near the streetcar and having access to a car and pollution-free Madison and the park blocks. I may be handicapped, but my COPD has not made me stupid. I am concerned that once Pam has their building, it will only be a matter of time before they are complaining of the burden to provide security when the museum is not open. At the very least, I would feel more comfortable if the times included in the 1984 ordinance, which you've already done, so I'll skip that, were included. A true compromise would be to build above and leave Madison open. Ironically, the city's design guidelines recommend, though don't prohibit against sky bridges in favor of having pedestrians with their eyes on the streets. Yet a sky bridge here would allow all, commuters, dog walkers, strollers, lunch eaters, bicyclists, runners, people with walkers and in wheelchairs, the hundreds of folks who use this level right of way every day to remain at street level and keeping the museum and neighborhood safer. This would also be consistent with the 2035 comp and central city plans that show the two Madisons as open easements. They are links in the proposed Green Loop, the pedestrian bicycle trail around the east and west sides of the central city that also connects the Hawthorne Bridge with the streetcar system. <coughs> Again, I ask you to vote against a building across vacated Madison. If the museum really wants and needs a new entrance, please send them back to the drawing board to come up with a design that is a win-win. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all three of you. Next three, please, Carla are Ivan Gold, Grace Serbu, and Ellen Vanderslice, and they'll be followed by Doris Ennis, Sylvia Lurie, and Ann Barkley. Mr. Mayor and Commissioners, good afternoon. I'm Ivan Gold. I've lived in Portland since 1971. Um, I think I have some direct experience with some of the access and usability issues involved here. I, I live in the Elliott Tower. I was a past chairman of the Elliott Tower. Um, I'm a patron of the museum. I'm also directly involved with um, 
Cedar Sinai Park, which is a major, um, uh, a major, a major um, uh, supported access facility for elderly people, and also has four subsidized housing. Uh, buildings right in the vicinity of the museum itself, involving about 450 residents. However, I, I stress that I'm speaking today only for myself. Um, we know how important the museum is, but we also have to acknowledge that its current buildings are physically difficult even and confusing, even for those of us without mobility issues. Um, the stairwells, the, the ramps in odd locations, the large and the very slow freight elevators, the hidden restrooms, present unacceptable barriers to anyone with mobility issues. And I'm specifically thinking about the people who visit from Cedar sinai Park or from the low-income housing uh, buildings on tours. And it's fundamentally stating the current museum does not work for visitors on crutches, with walkers, or in wheelchairs. Uh, the museum's privately funded proposals would remedy these issues and dramatically improve its physical presence. Um, the museum's been willing to accommodate the reasonable requests of its neighbors accustomed to the passageway. However, the improvements can't be realized without the Rothko Pavilion, and the Rothko Pavilion cannot be realized without the change in the ordinance. Minor inconveniences to a few cannot be allowed to obstruct major improvements for all. I respectfully ask the council to approve the proposed ordinance. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Grace Serbu. I too live in the Elliott Tower across the street from the museum, and I'm a trustee of the museum and a patron. As a frequent visitor, I see a lot of folks who are baffled or lost. Although security personnel are in every room and they're very helpful, Many people new to the museum find it hard to navigate the two very difficult and poorly connected buildings. Some folks have said that the proposed passage would be a psychological and physical barrier because it encloses the alley. I strongly disagree. The way it is now, it is not well lit or secure. It has corners and objects that uh, allow someone to hide behind. It is not as secure as a enclosed passage. Uh, it does offer seating to those looking for a place to hang out or do drugs, especially on the 10th Street side, on the back side of the Mark Building. So a passageway, well lighted and secure, would be a welcome addition. I personally choose to walk on Jefferson Street when it is dark and I'm alone. That side is lit and well and safe. Some say that they like the idea of a constricted tunnel, but that defeats the benefits of a lighted and secure but open welp and welcoming space. Inconvenience to a few in the neighborhood should not defeat the benefits to all visitors, most of which are not from this local neighborhood. We tend to forget, I think, the huge number of visitors to Portland and the museum who live in the rest of Oregon and internationally. Visitors to our fair city depend on us to get things right, to help them get around. Let's not let them down. So I support the passageway. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. I'm Ellen Vanderslice, and as a longtime advocate for walking, I'm here today to oppose this amendment. I believe it contravenes the adopted 2035 Comprehensive Plans Policy to maintain and expand Central City's highly interconnected pedestrian system. I fully support improved access between the main building and the Mark Building of the Portland Art Museum. And access could actually be improved today if the museum simply opened the door to the Mark Building that faces on the existing public walkway. The access control that would be required is no different from what will be needed at ground level in the event the Rothko Pavilion is constructed as proposed, when access to both the main and Mark Buildings would pass through an unsecured but enclosed pavilion. I support direct connection of the floors, above ground floors of the two museum buildings, and I appreciate that the hours that the pavilion would be open have been extended in this proposal. But an enclosure at the ground level that moves the public passage indoors and raises it four feet, I learned today, so that you have to climb up to it. Um, 
fundamentally changes and diminishes the public nature of the connection in a way that no design and no signage can mitigate. It's not in the public's interest to release our claim to the unencumbered passage that we have enjoyed for decades. And finally, I just want to mention that at the hearing in April, Commissioner Fish raised the possibility of enhancing Southwest Main Street as a corridor for walking and bicycling. And if you do choose to adopt this amendment, I respectfully request that you also direct the relevant agencies to proceed with just such an enhancement. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all three of you for your testimony. And that's a wonderful hat you're wearing. Next three are Doris Ennis, Sylvia Lurie, and Ann Barkley. I believe is the, Ann is the first name on Westdale. Good. And they'll be followed by Louisa Geyer, Joan Kirsch, and Bruce Morrisman. Good afternoon and welcome. Yes, I'm Doris Ennis, and my issue here is so different from everything else everybody's been talking about that it feels uh, that I'm not speaking in the same language. But anyway, uh, I am, I have, uh, uh, I'm 93 years old, and I have been a volunteer at the Art Museum for 43 years, and on Mondays when I go, uh, I've only been handicapped uh, for the last year. And so now when I go on Mondays there, when it's closed to the public, I find that only place open in the Belushi building is the loading dock. And to <laughs> go uh, up the loading dock, you have to walk up stairs. And there are, about eight, there are about eight stairs, and then you go by a microphone and you identify yourself, and then you're allowed in. Well, I can't do that anymore. So, but there is a ramp that takes you around the back, and like somebody spoke about before, it has some stairs that go up it to the west, some steep stairs that somebody fell down. And so anyway, I go around the ramp there and, and go to the side entrance, which is, it is all glass doors, but there's no one to let me in. And so, and here I have a, 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 a Max a, a driver there, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the wheelchair lift, program there, and I have this person wheeling me up there and, and then standing in front of a door that nobody's there to let you in. And so, so there's no way to get in on, on a Monday. And so I, then I was thinking, well, my, it would be nice to have this, this open, you know, this glass area open there at least at seven <laughs> o'clock in the morning to let me in. But uh, so anyway, that was what I was thinking about. And, uh, uh, I th feel that, and, and of course the, the, the uh, wheelchair driver, the ramp, dri the uh, van driver was standing there with me while waiting, nobody to let us in there at all. Well then people starting, people starting to go in by the, these steps way, I call to them and ask them to come around and let me in. And so it, that depends upon how it, uh, agile they are and how long it takes. So what I was asking for, was I was thinking, oh, that uh, uh, opening at seven in the morning sounds pretty good compared to no opening at all. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, I'm Ann Barkley. Uh, and I'm gonna keep this very short because in fact the woman who's last resident of um, one of the apartment buildings covered all of my points. What I wanna talk about briefly though is change management, which is really your job. We're in a very fast growing city and the region around us is growing as well. We're also becoming a city which is noted internationally and people are visiting here from all over the country and internationally. Managing the change that Portland is seeing today is a tough job and part of it takes into consideration what will be lost as change is made and how we accommodate those who are dispossessed either emotionally or in reality. There are a lot tougher questions before you today, these days than how we have access to the art museum. But this I hope you will remember. Change is hard, 
because people overestimate the value of what they have. And they underestimate the value of what they may gain by giving up on resistance. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Sylvia Lurie. I'm in my 11th year as a docent at the Portland Art Museum leading student tours and adult tours. And for the past 10 years, I've been involved with our uh, program to provide monthly tours for people who are blind or visually impaired. And so we have like 10 of those a year, plus some special tours for the Washington State School for the Blind and other organizations serving the blind. In all of those years, I think I can count on the fingers of one hand how many times we have taken a group into the contemporary galleries, because it's just too hard. It takes too long. It's too many elevators, too many stairs. Um, you've got to shepherd a group of 12, 15, 20 line people, and it's just really not worth it. We, we focus our efforts on the galleries we can reach easily. I have listened to what has been said, and I'm shocked to think that people would characterize the Portland Art Museum as a wealthy, private organization. This is the most civic-minded, public-oriented uh, organization imaginable. There's thousands of people involved in providing service to the public, usually for nothing. Usually it's volunteers. They're donating money and time. They live all over the area. Which brings up my second point, which is, what is our neighborhood? You know, we have, I, I feel like the administration has tried very hard to accommodate the wishes and needs of the neighbors. They think it's important, and I agree. But our neighborhood is the whole city. It's actually the whole region. We draw thousands of students from all over, not just from the streets around the museum. We draw volunteers from all over. We draw adult visitors from all over. I've had kids from Japan coming in on the plane who came to the museum first. I've had students from Redmond and many other places. So I'll finish by saying we have to think about changing in order to accommodate a changing Portland. And, and our arts, culture here are a big part of the draw that makes this city valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all three of you. The next three are Louisa Geyer, jo Joan Kirsch, and Bruce Morrison, and they'll be followed by Dan Webb, Elizabeth Lincoln, and Shannon Kramer. Hello, my name is Louisa Geyer. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to express my support of Portland Art Museum's request to change the ordinance governing Southwest Madison Street passageway so that the museum can build an enclosed structure that would join both buildings. I'm here as a resident of Portland and a museum member, and I was also on staff at the Portland Art Museum from 2010 to 2015. I believe this expansion is an extension of the museum's unwavering efforts to welcome and engage as many visitors as possible. From the very first days when Brian Fariza arrived at PAM and he would greet visitors at the door and introduce himself, to the appointment of the museum's first director of education and outreach, to the many exhibitions, lectures, and events that invite audiences of all ages to the museum, to providing free admission for children under 17 and opportunities for all to visit the museum for free. The Portland Art Museum has tirelessly dedicated the past decade to adapting as needed to serve all visitors. I believe the museum's expansion plans are aligned with their belief that the arts must be economically, intellectually, and physically accessible to all. The museum's expansion would improve all visitors' experiences by providing access to all the museum's galleries and spaces. That is not currently the case. This expansion is long due and will provide fulfilling experiences for our entire community. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Sarah Lampin, and um, Joan Kirsch, who is meant to be next, had to leave early, so she asked for me to read her statement for her. Um, so this letter is from Joan Kirsch, who is a docent at the Portland Art Museum. Uh, Dear Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners, while the passageway between muse between museum buildings seems necessary and practical, there are also other advantages for the museum and for the experiences of the public. 
People walking through the free corridor will certainly get a glimpse of the museum and whatever paintings and sculptures are nearby. Um, perhaps not on a rush day, but another day that quick look will tempt someone, plus friends, actually to enter the museum proper, so easily accessible. So many museums give a potential visitor a chance for a quick look right from the street into a large lobby as an invitation to stay. That could be a function of a passageway. For example, the lobby at MoMA in New York often serves as a throughway between 54th and 53rd streets. Free to be sure, but an encouragement to stay and pay. For people a bit shy or intimidated by a museum, such an easy exposure and entrance could very well bring the Portland Art Museum into greater connection with our community and a day to get off the street and out of the rain. As a Portland Art Museum docent of long standing and committed to the community value of the arts in Portland, I would appreciate your consideration of my views in making your decisions. Thank you, sincerely, Joan Kirsch. Thank you. Good afternoon. <coughs> Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Bruce Morrison. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the mayor and the commissioners for their service uh, to the city. Uh, I'm here in support of the uh, museum's Madison uh, Street uh, request. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, Oregon Public Broadcasting and uh, many of the preceding speakers uh, have uh, made clear, the current uh, uh, museum campus is a, a Frankenstein of a facility. Uh, you know, we don't need to speak for the problems, they, they speak for themselves. Um, I believe that the Rothko Pavilion uh, would greatly improve uh, access both to the museum and within the museum, as uh, previous speakers have uh, outlined. It would also provide a great deal more capacity for community events, educational events, uh, and exhibits. Uh, to my mind, we would be trading a little inconvenience uh, that is uh, restricting the uh, passage on Madison between 11 and 7 a.m. for a wealth of improved access and better service uh, to the community. Uh, there's no free lunch, but I think that uh, this is a uh, good trade. You know, our, our hometown is growing, uh, thank goodness, and our museum needs to grow with it. Thank you. Thank you. Next three, please. Are Dan Webb, Elizabeth Lincoln, and Shannon Kramer. Yeah, I don't have the same ones. Now. And they'll be followed by Ann Barkley, Heather Bovey, Bov Bov I believe it is, and Larry Cross. Good afternoon. Could you, uh, why don't you start us off? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dan Webb. I was in the space yesterday. Uh, uh, where the Rothko Pavilion would be constructed and thinking about someone, someone entering that space and instead of looking straight ahead as they proceeded on to the street, looking to the left or looking to the right into what I believe will be an inviting space that is going to be more successful engaging people with the museum who, who haven't been there before. I, I was thinking of that, the quote by Annie Dillard. I was a bell, but I did not know it until I was lifted and struck. There is the experience of, of something resonating within us that is so important, and it is so important to, to strategize, to bring people into that that building to have that experience. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Lincoln, and I'd like to read a letter that I've previously sent to the mayor and the commissioners, and I'd like to take a moment to thank Commissioner Fritz for her very speedy reply. Uh, dear Mayor Wheeler and City Commissioners, I'm writing in support of the proposed pavilion addition and renovations to the Portland Art Museum including the requested change to the ordinance governing the Southwest Madison Street passageway. As a docent of over eight years at the museum, I'm keenly aware of the need to make our institution more accessible to all visitors. 
School children arriving for their free school tours, as well as other guests, must often wait outdoors in inclement weather until the doors of the museum open because we have no protected space for them. As has been said, once inside, visitors often puzzle over how to get from one side of the museum to the other. Our cobbled together floor plan, along with an inconvenient stair and elevator configuration, is dauntingly confusing, even for those of us who've worked here for years. We've outgrown our space and the make-do solutions of previous generations to these structural difficulties. PAM Director Brian Fariso, as well as all of us at the museum, are heeding the call made by the greater community to provide more complete and safe access to the museum in terms of both the physical space and museum programming. PAM is providing a wide range of programs and budget-friendlier options to the greater Portland community, and I won't go into the long list. We truly seek to be a welcoming place for all Portlanders. CES Wood, one of the legendary figures in Portland civic history and also a key founder of the Art Museum, once remarked that, quote, the citizens are the riches of the city, end quote. <coughs> I would suggest that the Portland Art Museum is another of the city's riches, a civic treasure located right in the heart of the park blocks downtown. Please allow the museum to continue its mission of becoming the best civic and arts center it can possibly be by approving whatever measures are necessary. Thank you. Thank you. I, Mayor, can I just clarify Please, something? Please, Commissioner Fish. It, it's the unofficial policy of this council that when we get emails, we forward them to Commissioner Fritz's office for a response. I just okay. want, I just Good want to know. Good to know. Thank you. And, and, and she stays up late to answer them, but I just want to point out. At least one of us was raised right, so that's the good news. Good afternoon. One out of four is not a great ratio, guys. Not, not very. Uh, my name is Shannon Kramer. I'm a new docent at the Art Museum. Um, so full disclosure, definitely I'm biased. But I would ask us, especially you on the council, the commissioners, to think about the purpose of the museum and the wider community and the purpose of curating change when it comes to change in Portland. Downtown is not necessarily relevant for people in my generation. We don't come down here to hang out. We're not using that open public space. It is not somewhere that is currently vibrant and relevant for the future. The thing you are editing that made this private property that has public access and part of its purpose is 50 plus years old and has achieved its purpose of a walkable downtown. So the idea that one block improved for the greater good and for better access and education for the public to see what we have in the museum I'm sorry, but it's a fallacy. We are one of the most walkable cities in the entire nation. So I implore you to think about the general purpose of the museum and, and what Rothko Pavilion, what the name that means more to people who don't even know anything about art, they've heard the name Rothko, what that could do for Portland as a city and what it could do for a vibrant downtown and a safer downtown and a place that rains eight months out of the year. You know? I, I really have nothing else to say besides let's look at the wider picture and not be pulled down by those who are using conjecture about future malice from the museum to validate their own feelings. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Next three, please. Next three are Heather Beauvais, Larry Cross, and Mary Chapin. And we'll, they'll be followed by Ted Chillis, Joanne Perry Mueller, yeah. and Judith Thompson Schneider. Good afternoon. Hi, thank you for listening today. I am here testifying today, oh, I'm sorry, I'm Heather Boucher, and I am a staff member at the Portland Art Museum. I have the, uh, the, the honor to take care of the art on a daily basis. And so I'm here to testify today to provide support for the submitted pavilion proposal. As someone who has repeatedly witnessed the challenges that are present for visitors with and without disabilities, this project will allow improved access to the galleries and educational programs. Currently, galleries are severed from each other by being in two completely separate buildings, creating a challenging maze for anyone who visits. I cannot even fathom how unwelcoming this institution must be for those visitors who require access by not using stairs. As someone who works hard to make sure Pam's art is properly cared for so it is available to the public, it is disheartening to witness comments and frustrations from my community members who have little to no desire to visit because they believe this place is not for them, whether it be access issues or the stigma that this place is for other people. 
Pam has been working hard over the past few years to work towards change, and I firmly believe this institution can achieve those goals. Currently, the Portland Art Museum is in the extensive process of equity and inclusion developments that will greatly change and shape its future, both internally and externally. Allowing this project to move forward is a major part of these planned improvements. <clears throat> Excuse me, improvements. As the art museum looks to become more inclusive and equitable to our communities, adequate spaces are required to hold successful events and educational opportunities. As, this as the exhibition schedule and educational programs have been modified over the years to attempt to meet the community needs, it has become abundantly clear that structural improvements are necessary. These spaces currently do not exist or have reached maximum capacity. By listening to the community through one-on-one -on -one conversations, um, I believe this institution has come with a viable plan that will bring new opportunities. I'm excited for communities to experience improved gallery spaces, which means improved spaces for the art. Donors throughout PAM's history have trusted us with their donations of art, and we need to continue that level of trust. Can I just ask you a question about this? Is that all right, Mayor? Please, Commissioner. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting emails I received was about the concern that in the current depiction, there's a lot of glass in all four floors there. Isn't that light bad for art? It is, and from my understanding, um, there we will be limiting what art, if any, is exposed in that facility. If you remember from Brian's drawings, the new galleries that will be added are on the, um, like one gallery is on the end, and others will be modified that currently exist that will improve those spaces. Um, I'm not sure what art, if any, will go in that glass space for that very reason, because light and, um, UV exposure is very damaging to some art. Yeah, so would that maybe result, when, I know you haven't gone through the design yet and you're not part of the design team. No. I hope that you and other experts will be informing that process should this go forward. Um, I know for a fact. Because the current depiction of it's all glass, you know, like the, the glass palace, crystal palaces we had in, in England, um, would not be good for art on any levels, would it? No, no, not at all. And I know um, for a fact that there have been collaborative discussions regarding that very topic from the beginning. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're here because all these important people heard you and uh, I hope they'll include you in the uh, planning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Weaver Chapin, and like Heather, I am a staff member at the Portland Art Museum. And I can assure you, Commissioner Fritz, that uh, Brian has a full staff of very passionate and opinionated people telling him exactly where to put the art. <laughs> so I consider myself part of that team. Excellent. I won't worry about it anymore. <laughs> um, I have worked at major museums throughout the country, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, at the Chicago's um, famous Art Institute, and also at the Milwaukee Art Museum. That makes me a veteran of several museum expansion and renovation projects. And the reason I want to speak to you today is that I think this one is really different for a key reason. This isn't a vanity project to boost a director's career, to help a chief curator find his or her next position, or to satisfy um, an egotistic donor. This is a fix-it solution. And I think the fact that when Brian was trying to think through some of these designs, he turned to an architecture firm that is perhaps the most egoless firm imaginable. They are not there to make their own names. They are there to really serve the public in a sensitive and thoughtful manner. Um, I feel it's important to mention that as well because I think the aims of this are very, very pure and I'm, I'm saddened to hear some people refer to it as a bait and switch. I believe that the proposal establishes thoughtful and reasonable access for both our immediate neighbors as well as for those who travel throughout the Northwest to reach the museum. As a curator, I have to think not only about the art that's on the wall today, but is it going to be preserved and accessible to our public in 10 years or 20 years, or I like to think in 100-year blocks? And I would urge you, as you consider all these opinions, to also think long-term. Think about not just discomfort of today or tomorrow, 
but where do we need to go as a city, not just for those of us here in the room, but for the hundreds of thousands of people who will come in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor Wheeler. My name is Larry Cross. I'm a person with a disability. I am also a commissioner on the Portland Commission on Disability. But like Angel, I'm speaking for myself, not the commission. This, muse this uh, museum expansion greatly excites me because I and thousands of other people will be able to more fully enjoy and appreciate the museum and its treasures. On unifying the two existing structures by building the Rothko Pavilion, which I think should be viewed as a Rothko connection. It's connecting these buildings. And it will create uh, an, uh, one seamless museum campus, dramatically increasing the accessibility and visitability of the museum. And I'm going to divert from what I wrote. I've heard a lot of architectural design begins with schematic design, design development, then you have the construction documents. It's my understanding that the museum is not even yet at the schematic design as we've seen today. I think the that first floor is, of, is still in flux. I think I'm hearing it's closed off. It's not closed off, it really hasn't been designed yet. And I think that's very important, but I think it's really important to look at the long view of this museum expansion. That's what's important to me. This physical flow will, will ex exponentially improve. The seamless level connections between the buildings will, will eliminate the present Sherlock Holmes requirement of getting <laughs> to and from the Jubits. The campaign connections will allow the museum to expand its programming, increase its inclusion, encourage new attendees, not only local, but national and international visitors, and make the museum an exceptional example of universal design. I encourage the council to amend the ordinance and allow the Roscoe Pavilion or Connection and the Connections campaign, which was basically started by an anonymous donor, not David Geffen, to uh, improve this, have, to have this be built. So the museum expansion will maximize accessibility to broaden this audience available to everybody, one word, and everybody, two words. Thank you. Very good, thanks. Next three, please. Or Ted Chillis, Joanne Perry Mueller, and we're gonna go with Ted Smith, and they'll be followed by Judith Thompson Schneider, Richard Lowenstone, and Anthony Fell. Oh, Hi, I'm Joanne Perry Mueller, and I have been active with the Portland Art Museum as a volunteer for over 20 years, and I schlep in all the way from Banks, Oregon, about 25 miles west, which is a little different than most of the people sitting in this room. Um, I have read about the courtyard between the two buildings being designated as an open space or pass-through for the neighborhood many years ago. But since then, the Masonic Temple was remodeled to allow expansion of the museum. And with that expansion, there was never a good way to reach one building from the other. I gave many tours, and that is close to 500 tours, to people from young childhood to senior citizen age, and it was extremely cumbersome to have to go down the stairs and back up the stairs on the other side and going through the passageway down below. Because people with disabilities often had to use the elevator, it took an extremely extra amount of time for them to have to go down to the basement and then up again on the other side. So I hope that our lovely museum, which is such a delightful educational and inspirational destination for the citizens of Portland, metropolitan area, the state, other parts of our country and the world, because I had give many, gave many tours to people from other countries, can be allowed to expand its mission to introduce people to the richness of its collections in a more professional and accessible way by creating this lovely connection. Since the current proposal thoughtfully includes meeting the needs of the neighborhood residents by allowing the courtyard to continue being used as a pass-through, and I can't visualize how not having a connection on the main ground level really improves the situation. Um, I think that that's a very important. But in addition to the logistics of moving around the museum, I just want to mention that I think we do need an improvement to the beauty of the front and rear views of our museum, and I think that this pavilion does it. And inside that glass pavilion, I believe that sculptures and rotating art is perfectly reasonable to anticipate. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. <clears throat> I have uh, put before you a... Uh, What's your name? Uh, excuse me, my name's Ted Chillis. Um, I am a retired architect. I 
prepared for you some documents uh, and so that you can see. I am a PAM neighbor, longtime member. I'm excited about the new expansion. However, the design of the pavilion eliminates the pedestrian walkway. The major change would damage the fabric of our neighborhood. Yes, I'm a retired architect practicing 40 years in Portland. I'm familiar with the urban fabric. My current concern is Pam is ignoring our neighborhood. In 1987, I designed University Park a few blocks away. In 1997, I designed St. James Apartments, which are across the street from the Art Museum. Both of these buildings respected the neighborhood. I stopped yesterday and asked myself, why won't the pedestrian way be preserved? Why won't Pam respect its neighbors and the easement that dates from 1968? I bring to you a solution to the problem which will make everyone happy. First, look at the physical conditions and levels of the two buildings I did yesterday. It is possible to leave the pedestrian pathway and form a bridge over the walkway. It is essentially forming a tunnel through the building. And the size would be 21 feet wide, which is the existing width of the walkway today and nine feet high. Uh, I excuse the audience for not being able to see my exhibits. Uh, the first exhibit shows a view from the east side where the existing walkway is today, it remained at the same level all the way through the building. Looking at exhibit two from the west side of the building, you'll see the walkway uh, continuing through the building. Uh, and finally, there's a section between the two buildings, the north building and the south building. It shows where the passageway is. It does not stop visitors in the museum getting from one side of the building to the other. There's a seven foot rise, but the visitors walking through the building will automatically have to go upstairs or an elevator. This is no different. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate your, your, your um, time and expertise of showing the pictures of how this could work. That's very helpful, thank you. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is, is Ted Smith, and first of all, I want to say three Ted's in a room. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been in a room that had three Ted's. You know, that, that, that is true. It's and too confusing. It's, we'll it's, call him Edward. You know, the, the, <laughs> the thing that's interesting is uh, Ted is becoming such a rare name, it's going to be retro cool pretty soon. I'm convinced of it. Dream on. <laughs> so I'm cool. Yes, sir. you're cool. <laughs> you're cool. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, my, again, my name is Ted Smith. I work for the Portland Art Museum. I, I, I've been there for 10 years. I work for security there. And so uh, I'm going to talk about something completely different. We've talked about the art and um, the benefits to the museum and its, its collection. But I want to talk about um, our neighborhood. I've been there 10 years, and uh, um, I've worked with the neighbors and all around it because we, we, we share the same space, and things happen. Um, and I've had to be a, a part of trying to resolve issues that happen out there because we have the park, we have uh, people walking, we have medical issues, we have uh, criminal issues, we have all kinds of issues. And as and then security and being in that area there, I have to be conscious of our neighbors and what's going on constantly. Um, why I'm for this is that enclosure. It gives us a chance to be a true part of the neighborhood. I've talked to the director, Brian, and really what I want to do is for us to be a part of that neighborhood watch. We try to work with the law enforcement. Um, the extended hours that we have gives us, my, the staff, um, our security staff, a chance to actually do more for the neighborhood past our closing hours. Um, uh, we, we do it now after hours when people get hurt and they have a place to go to. We are that sanctuary. Mm -hmm. I like to believe that the museum itself is a sanctuary for not only the neighborhood but the entire city. 
on the wall, on the, when you go to the Mark Building, and a lot of people walk by it and they don't notice it, it says, and I see it every day, erected to God and dedicated to the service of humanity. That is what we're here for. Um, so that enclosure gives accessibility, not only to first responders, but also in the event of a disaster. And we've seen it happening across the country, it's happened. We need places where people can seek shelter. The enclosure gives us accessible shelter for everybody in the area. Working with the first responders, um, we have the, the footage, a square space, two ballrooms. We can support the community in, in the event of a disaster. And I've been working with our department and, and the director about being good neighbors. And, and like I said, I've been there 10 years and I've tried to be a good neighbor, just me and all of our staff um, have tried to do that. And that's why I'm for the pavilion. It, what it does is it gives us a safe place, a sanctuary for the community as well as the people in that city. Very good, and, and uh, I'd love to connect you with our uh, Portland Bureau of Emergency Management Director because we are always looking for institutional partners in the community around emergency resilience. So thank you for suggesting that. Commissioner Fritz? And I hope you too will be invited, and others on the security staff will be invited to submit comments on the design of the renovations because clearly with all this priceless artwork around, if you had an emergency situation, you wouldn't want everybody to have access to that. So there needs to be a, a safe, secure space as well as Two ways. Yes. So I hope I hope you've been involved in that. Thank you for yes, your testimony. Yeah. Great. Thanks, all three of you. Next three, please. Are Judith Thompson Snyder, Richard Lowenstone, and Anthony Fell, and they'll be followed by Diane Lowenstone, Susan Bliss, and Laura D. Foster. Good afternoon. Sir, would you like to start? Yes. I'll start. Thank you. We are Judy Schneider and Richard Lowenson, and we are reading two halves of testimony on behalf of Jeff Wren, Mayor and Commissioners. I am writing to express my opposition. Okay, too loud. Is it? Oh, that, that sounds better, too. <laughs> Thank you. I am writing to express my opposition to the council granting an amendment to the existing city ordinance governing the Madison Passageway and to permitting the Portland Art Museum to build its proposed Rothko Pavilion in such a manner as to block the passageway. I would present my comments in person at today's council meeting, but I am unable to do that because of my work obligations. Pam is representing that construction of the Rothko Pavilion will involve sensitivity to the disabled and those with strollers. Pam also now says that it will agree to permit those with bicycles and pets to cross through the pavilion. Further, Pam suggests that the pavilion will be a new gathering space for the public. These claims do not add up. While it is feasible to permit members of the public to cross through the pavilion lobby, mere feasibility does not equal real access. Anyone deigning to cross through the lobby will have to attend to two sets of doors, dodge users of the pavilion, and become the focus of museum patrons. Far from enabling the disabled ready access, forcing them through the pavilion would have the effect of making them objects of attention. The council should not be in the business of imposing obstacles on those who merely want to go from one block to the other. If the council feels compelled to impose such obstacles, the least it should do is include in the ordinance 
the bike and pet owner access Pam says it would grant. The current proposed ordinance appears to give Pam carte blanche to deny access at its whim. As for the idea that the Rothko Pavilion would be a new gathering space, I would hope the council grasps the hollowness of this claim. One must ask, really, are people going to gather in a lobby space? The existing open Madison passageway is well used by people to eat lunch, play music, stroll, and sit <coughs> while enjoying its openness. These uses contribute directly to the quality of life in Portland. The pavilion would all but end them. There are aesthetic reasons to deny Pam the required ordinance amendment. I will not belabor reasons having to do with the pavilion design itself, other than to say that the design Pam has unveiled is a masterwork of mediocrity. But the council should recognize that Portland has gained a national, if not international, reputation for its downtown livability, and that livability has much to do with the fact that our city blocks are small and human-sized. Permitting Pam to build the proposed Rothko Pavilion would transform the existing pair of human-sized blocks into a super block that would hulk over the South Park blocks as a bastion of elitism. Our city's reputation would suffer as a result. There is no need for a super block. Pam could join the existing museum structures with a Skybridge structure. This has been done to great effect by other museums. Skybridge would enhance access by the public while providing an aesthetically compelling addition to the block. While I am not an architect or engineer, it seems likely that a Skybridge structure would better protect art than the proposed pavilion. The opening and closing of access doors would cause constant temperature and humidity changes. Finally, I would ask that Council give serious consideration to the fact that Pam has advanced the Rothko Pavilion and requested an amendment of the existing ordinance without involving community partners. Pam's attitude throughout has been that of entitlement and indifference to the interests of those who live in the cultural district and beyond. To now grant Pam the amendment to the existing ordinance and build its proposed pavilion would reward a major Portland institution for engaging in a planning process utterly antithetical to what Portland stands for. Pam effectively is asking the council to disregard its duty to the public at large. The council should respectfully deny that request. Thank you for consideration of these points. Jeff Wren. Very good. Super timing. Well Thank done. you. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Anthony Fell. I'm the owner of Toys and More store at Lloyd Center Mall, but I'm a 15 year volunteer for Potluck in the Park. For those of you who are not familiar with Potluck in the Park, we provide meals, uh, since uh, for 26 years to homeless in O'Brien Square. Lately, we've been moved to um, underneath the Hawthorne Bridge, but hope to return to uh, O'Brien Square. Um, for those of you who don't know what goes on, but the, uh, the Portland Art Museum has let us use for the past five years their main ballroom to host the largest Christmas dinner in all of Portland. We feed 1,500 homeless people in the beautiful ballroom with statues and our guests really love it. Next door to the, uh, to the ballroom basically is the area in question. We tent it over uh, during that meal to provide a, a heating area and waiting area for our guests. Uh, by putting this pavilion up will facilitate us, basically when we, when we do the uh, potluck meal, uh, facilitate us to basically uh, avoid paying $5,000 worth of tents that we put up in that area. We really support this um, uh, uh, addition to the museum and want to praise the museum. They have really, really helped us out and the community and our guests um, and um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it. Uh, I've had a request uh, for those of you testifying next, if we could slow down the pace just a bit. The closed captioning people are having a little bit of troubles keeping up, so just slightly, slightly slower. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. The next three are Diane Lowenshon, Susan Bliss, and Laura D. Foster, and they'll be followed by Mary Vogel, Mary C. Hinckley, and Donald Jenkins. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and, Com and Commissioners. My name is Diane Lowenson, and I'm a downtown cultural uh, district homeowner, condo owner. I'm also a longtime PAM member, supporter, donor. Um, I've served on a former out count art council board for PAM. I, too, long for a beautiful new glass space to house the Rothko Pavilion and to, to join the two buildings. 
In addition, I volunteered as a guide for more than 10 years to school-aged children for a nonprofit that gives two-hour walking tours downtown. We talk to the children about the history, public art, and architecture of downtown. One of the things I did in every single one of my tours was to stress the importance of the 200 square foot block. We forget, unless we're the crows flying around in the sky, that Portland is a web of little tiny squares that are 200 feet square. What's interesting is that it was platted this way to give more corner space to retail spaces and offices. This was back in the pre-electric light age when that was really important. But some of the unintended consequences of that have been grand vistas, a more intimate setting. And it's been one of our gifts. I don't know how this wound up being a them against us discussion but it has from the very beginning, and I fault both sides on that. We both should have reached out because this needs to be a win-win situation. I sincerely believe that an eight to 10 foot wide open breezeway would keep Pam from being that visual and actual super block in downtown Portland. There's only one other one, and that's Big Pink that they built. They provide 24 seven access through that super block, which is two blocks being combined, and they do that year round. That was a requirement on a very similar easement change. We lived as a young family of four in the Netherlands without a car, with young children. We did that because of good urban planning and we lived on bicycles. It was a climate similar to Portland. You want more pedestrian travel, you want fewer cars. Keep that 200 square block goal. It's very important. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Laura Foster. I'm the author of seven guidebooks about exploring Portland and nearby communities on foot. My books are Portland Hill Walks, The Portland Stairs Books, and a few others. I also lead walking tours for the Portland Bureau of Transportation and for nonprofits and other entities. The Portland Art Museum, it's a beloved institution, but it is just one of many places that make Portland a unique and creative mecca and a destination for urban explorers. Our urban streets are one of our city's greatest treasures. On them, the city and its citizens display our creativity. These common spaces, our streets, bind us. Whether we're liberal or conservative, they are like the Benson Bubblers or our many neighborhood parks, part of our beloved civic Okay, part of our beloved civic heritage. We, the citizens of this generation, are stewards of these spaces for the generations that come after us. Our streets, or easements in this case, are not up for grabs by the nearest cultural institution. The Portland Art Museum's stated intention to build walls across this common space seems unthinkable to me. The glass walls do not invite passage, they convey privilege. They are not open 24 seven as any city street is. They have walls and doors, two things which by definition denote exclusivity. Other cities provide excellent examples that could be adapted to this site to allow unimpeded grade level passage. Can you imagine a visitor to Portland or a person with a handicap or a parent pushing a stroller laden with kid and gear, seeing this glass wall from Park or 10th Rather than go investigate to see if the passage is free and flows through, they would turn and walk the much longer way around either the main building or the Mark building. How, the, how is that, as the museum argues, an improvement to accessibility? The perception that walls and doors give is private property, the very opposite of a public space. I urge you to hear Portlanders in our opposition to this use of a public right of way. Thank you. Thank you. Laura, can I just make one comment? Sure. Thank you. First of all, thank you for coming in. And I gave my son, my then 12, the Portland Stairs book for Christmas last uh -huh. year. Glad but to I, hear it. I said it, that we were going to together discover all the stairs in your book. <laughs> and I have a confession, we're a little behind. But <laughs> it is a terrific book. Thank you. And I, we hope to discover many more. I appreciate hearing that. Good afternoon. Hello, I'm Susan Bliss, and the Art Museum is my neighbor across 10th Avenue. In Washington, D.C., I spent 24 years at the Smithsonian Institution as a press officer during an unprecedented period of institutional <coughs> growth. 
During construction of the Smithsonian's Sackler Gallery devoted to Asian art, I served as the gallery's director of public affairs, briefing the press and public on its construction and design. In this capacity, I observed the sometimes lengthy but often rewarding give and take between museum personnel and the architects. Once completed, no museum exactly replica replicated the original drawings, but thoughtful back and forth brought all parties to compromises that met most everyone's needs. Negotiations over building design and function were anticipated elements of the building process. So it's hard to see why Portland's museum, with its need for additional space, clearer signage, and accessibility for visitors and staff, still refuses to ask for design changes that could bring the community solidly to its side. A second level sky bridge, for example, might be considered leaving Madison Street open to car-free traffic as mandated by city ordinance. But the museum chose to let its contract without consulting an important constituency. We who live down the street or across the river, we who ride bikes, use wheelchairs, walk dogs, or lug vegetables from the farmer's market, we want to support the museum, but cannot accept a glass barricaded thoroughfare or a double cul-de-sac when the museum is closed. We sought discussion with the museum on these issues when they announced their plans. The museum did not respond to our concerns. And we still can't grasp their refusal to engage in discussion of, of the project prior to asking for changes to the city ordinance. I urge the city council to keep Madison unencumbered and the museum to offer their designers a shot at addressing important community needs. Thank, Thank you. you, and perfect timing. Next three, please. Are Mary Vogel, Mary C. Hinckley, and Donald Jenkins. And they'll be followed by Bryce Lilly, Deidre Hall, and Jackie Willingham. I'm Mary Vogel, PAM member and volunteer from downtown's West End, where I have collected over 100 signatures on a petition asking you to uphold the Mary, original Mary, ordinance. Could, Mary, could you slide the mic back just oh, a little bit away from you? Might be this thing here. Let me take this off. Oh, thank um, you. Okay where uh, I have, um, okay, to uphold the original ordinances for the vacated Madison Street. The people who signed include many in wheelchairs, scooters, walkers, or using canes. Over half are from the nearby low-income housing in the West End that Ivan Gold um, talked about. A few lunch at Meals on Wheels, or they are students from PSU, or members of Portland Tenants United or PDX Jimbies. They, re they read or speak at least seven different languages. Thanks, Google Translate. Um, these people all want you to keep the current public right-of-way requirements between the two buildings of the art museum. They believe the most equitable solution to the museum's desire to have connectivity between its buildings is for Pam to build connections on the second, third, and fourth floors. They believe it stretches credulity to believe that Pam will keep those doors open to people with pets after the first few dogs poop or puke on Pam's floors. It stretches credulity to believe that Pam will keep those doors open to cyclists after the first few bikes track in mud or debris. And it stretches credulity to believe that Pam will keep those doors open when snow and ice, uh, the, the snow and ice that the museum um, it was closed for 10 days in um, late uh, 2016. Will Pam really send personnel to let those of us who can, tra who can travel during such events come through with our yak tracks and micro spikes on our feet. In instead of creating a, um, a new super block between Southwest Park and Southwest 10th, I ask you to fix the one super block we currently have in the West End by exploring the creation of a Madison walkway between Southwest 11th and 12th. I submitted the attached proposal last April as well. Um, please give it your attention while we still have a chance to act on this property that has sat vacant and derelict since the Morris Marks House move on September 30th. 
Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello, my name is Mary Chemenko Hinckley. I moved, and thank you uh, for hearing me. Um, I moved here 20 years ago from the Bay Area, and in looking at Portland as a place to live, uh, one of the big draws was the uh, artistic community here. We have uh, opera, the symphony, theaters, the Portland Art Museum, um, and I think in terms of a city and its uh, relevance uh, to a community, uh, Portland has so much to offer its citizens and having this building making the Portland Art Museum a uh, more viable and more accessible institution I think is very important. Uh, I think the pavilion will not just be the Rothko Pavilion, but it will be the Portland Pavilion. It'll serve as a living room in our downtown. It's a meeting space for visitors, uh, for groups. Uh, people have said that now um, people visiting the museum have to jockey for space in the uh, entry. And I think that um, it makes the building more viable. Uh, my father, who was 98 this year, visited the Portland Art Museum uh, over many years. And as he aged, first having a difficulty walking with a cane, then a walker, then being in a wheelchair, uh, each visit over the years to the Portland Art Museum became more and more of a challenge to finally um, just making the visits more difficult. So I think this uh, passage uh, opening and connecting the buildings will help uh, other people with disabilities and with mobility issues. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Donald Jenkins. I s decided to uh, make my testimony today because I have been connected with the Portland Art Museum over 20 years. My first job was here in 1954, and much of my career was in this place and in the museum. And I thought maybe today to just show, talk a little bit about our history and how that connects with this block that now causes us so much problem. When I first came here, it was still a street, but a stub of it street. Cars parked on either side. And there, all you saw on the south side was a, uh, the back rooms used by the school, which at that time was part of the museum. So when in uh, 1970, when the new, uh, when they tore down the old um, remains of the original school that had been there for the, and that was being used by the uh, museum school, um, <clears throat> they added a, a feature. They had to lower the, uh, um, I'm going to have to show, uh, shorten this. <laughs> At any rate, we ended up with a garden that people could look at but could not go in. And it was very attractive. And it meant, because of that uh, uh, decision that was made, uh, they could stop and look at it. And there were no more cars there. But then, in 2005, when we acquired the uh, uh, you we have ended up with the, the situation we have now. Now, I always thought this was a wonderful thing because it was, when you think of all the people who went into all of this development that the museum has gone through over these years, from that simple place where I joined about only 20 people to be the museum uh, assistant and subsequently had my career there. I saw that museum grow and it grew as 
a, not an, um, a civic or a governmental entity, but as a, uh, a gift to this museum that has grown and the coming of this, being able to use this block between the buildings has uh, helped, but it is, needs to be re uh, improved and that's what we're now talking about. Just think of this, 300,000 people visited this museum last year. There are 19,000 members pouring their time and their money in this venture. We need to be cognizant of that history, and that's my- Very good. Thank you, sir. Done. We, we appreciate that history. Thank that you for really telling us. Could Thank I you just answer the question that Commissioner Fish asked of Judith earlier? And one of the reasons we perhaps don't trust that the art museum would in fact um, abide by a new ordinance if they get a building there is that currently they don't, uh, they do close the plaza for private events. I haven't noticed that they've done it since last April when more of us became aware of the, um, of the ordinance, but um, many, many times I have complained that I was not able to get through there because of a private event. I've actually gone into the museum and asked to talk to the director. Of course, it's always on a weekend and the director is not there. But in any case, they do close it now for, for private events altogether. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your testimony, all three of you. Next three, please. Are Bryce Lilly, Deidre Hall, and Jackie Willingham. And they'll be followed by Elizabeth Thomas, uh, Ma Ma Mawa Francis Lee, and Shirley Rockner. Would like to start. Shall I start? Please, yes, thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'm Jackie Willingham, and I am chair of the Board of Literary Arts, a, a nonprofit literary center located in downtown Portland. Uh, professionally, I'm a part-time consultant, and prior to that, in 2015, I retired from my corporate career at Standard Insurance Company, which I'm mentioning because my job there was to oversee the payment of benefits and the provision of rehabilitation services to people with disabilities. I am pleased to advocate for the Rothko Pavilion for several reasons. The Portland Art Museum's master plan and the associated pavilion will greatly enhance access for people of all abilities and enable a broad range of experiences with art by providing 30,000 additional square feet of gallery space and more capacity for education and public programs. As a valued cultural partner, the museum has served as the central location for Wordstock Portland's Book Festival the last three years. Just a month ago, 10,000 Wordstock attendees appreciated access to the museum as well. Some 1,500 of those attendees were youth or children, many of whom visiting the museum for the very first time. The Rothko Pavilion will provide additional covered space for Wordstock, as well as other community events. As one who has visited the museum numerous times, I know it is difficult, as well as confusing, for many to navigate between floors of the two existing buildings. The pavilion responds directly to the access and navigation challenges that museum attendees now experience. The Rothko Pavilion shows that the museum can stretch to meet community demands if the city provides it with the ability to realize its potential while meeting the needs of citizens for a safe and attractive passageway. I commend the executive director and the staff of the museum for their willingness to engage with disability rights advocates and citizen representatives. 
The design for the Rothko Building is a beautiful, necessary, and welcome addition to the Portland community as a public gathering space. Thank you, appreciate it. Good afternoon. Hello, I'm Bryce Lilly. I am the uh, sen uh, senior maintenance technician at the museum. They wanted to give me a raise, but I held out for a title. <laughs> and um, although it is not part of my function, I lately I've been when we're short staffed and janitorial, I, I volunteer and I do the outside rounds in, in the area that we're talking about in a little bit more. And uh, I am just here to state that that is an uncivilized area. Somebody mentioned, I was, didn't know how to say it, but they, they said uh, poop and puke. So, uh, and the poop and puke that I deal with isn't necessarily from dogs. Uh, and the dogs don't leave the hypodermic needles behind. This is just, I, I see the, uh, you know, the changes that the museum propose as a civilizing element to a, uh, you know, a questionable situation. And uh, I'm quite frankly at where the rubber meets the road. I, I, I don't do it all the time, but I've, in the last few months I've done it a couple dozen times. And uh, it is not unusual to uh, you know, find things as really unacceptable to anybody. And at the Elliott Towers, I'm, I have really good relationships with everyone there and everyone in, is responsible for their dogs, but there's another element, and it is not from them, that uh, that we have to deal with. Thank you, and, and I want to thank you for the work you do, and I want you to know that we're having separate conversations with some folks in the community around some of the livability issues in the neighborhood. So th thank you for uh, the, the hard work that you are doing. Thank we you. appreciate it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, members of council and mayor, thank you for having me here today. My name is Deidre Hall, and I'm a commissioner on the City of Portland Commission on Disability. Um, speaking as a, as a citizen today, like my other um, commission members today. Um, I'm here to speak about the plans, of course, for the Rothko Pavilion as it relates to accessibility for all citizens of our beautiful city. It's crucial that the pavilion be kept open during the hours which are in alignment with the hours of the Portland streetcar. This will allow all citizens, including seniors and people's, people with disabilities, the ability to continue to access public transportation, which is vital for achieving and maintaining independence in our daily lives. I'm excited to have an ongoing relationship with the museum uh, to continue working on not just the physical access, but on progr programmatic access as well. This is a great opportunity um, to advocate for and see the benefits of universal, universal design. I also want to just make a, a personal note. I know that um, a lot of people have testified today. Um, our preferred term is people with disabilities. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put that out there since I have the microphone. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Next three, please. Are Elizabeth Thomas, Maiwa Francis Lee, and Shirley Rockner, and they'll be followed by Wilfred Mueller Crispin, Stephanie Parrish, and Charles Ryberg. And uh, for folks who are patiently sitting upstairs, thank you very much for, for doing that. We're starting to see some chairs open up. It looks like we have five or six down here, so if somebody's in a place where they can't see up there, uh, we're starting to, to have some seats down here open. So thank you for those of you <coughs> who are sitting upstairs today. We appreciate it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Thomas and haven't had any water for about two and a half hours, so excuse my dry voice. Um, first of all, I just wanted to mention um, someone had, had indicated that the museum was closed 10 days last year due to inclement weather. Um, it may have been closed for two and a half days to public entrance, but believe me, we always have staff protecting the art, watching all the control room. Um, the museum will always be staffed, and I have no doubt that people with crampons, snowshoes, whatever, will be welcome through the museum. I appreciated what Bryce said as well about cleaning up the exterior of the buildings. Uh, yeah, we're dealing with, with a lot of issues right now, so I just wanted to affirm those two points. The museum's front entrance, which was beautifully designed by Pietro Beluski, was built in an era when people with mobility and disability issues were forgotten. Today, we still don't have a front entrance for those people. If you're in a wheelchair, you've got to find the ramp. If you're in a walker, you've got to find the ramp. And you've got to up the, go to up that side, store, side entrance that Doris Ennis talked about so eloquently. Um, we probably need to do a little better job on watching for people tapping on our windows. 
people talked a lot about the wayfinding, so I won't go into that part of my talk, but I did say, or would like to say, as you've heard, the comprehensive plan for the pavilion, which includes open and clearly visible linear collections, connections on every floor will really remedy a lot of the, of the wayfinding issues. But it's that ground floor main entrance that will be for everyone that is so important. People shouldn't have to think that they have to go in the side door or the back door to get into the museum. People who come from 10th Avenue shouldn't have to think that they, that they gotta find their way to the front of the museum. This pavilion front ground entrance will feel open for everyone and we don't know what the doors will look like yet. There's a lot of doors that are still, I mean, doors are under design all the time. It's, I seriously cannot envision a door with a handle. I see electric doors, I see air doors. So I, I think that those issues, that those will be addressed and, and looked at in the design process. So please disre disregard those concerns. Finally, the pavilion will be also be a welcome addition to the South Park blocks and the surrounding neighborhood streets, which are becoming less hospitable every year. I heard from many people that the only time they feel comfortable spending leisure time in the park blocks between the museum and the other side of the street is when the farmer's market is open. A vibrant new structure can be inviting, exciting, and bustling with activity that will spill out into the park and beyond. It will be a shot in the arm for this weary area. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Commissioner Fritz. I have Fritz. some questions since you Thank talked you. about wayfair, wayfinding mm -hmm. and, and flow. What, will the two front doors currently on the park blocks remain there or will they, are they envisioned to go and just have the one? The front, the, as I understand, the park block, the um, Pietro Beluski main entrance, the doors will remain but they'll cease to be the front entry because they'll plant that, that won't be a, a, a the lobby anymore. Well, the lobby of the museum will be in the pavilion where they, oh, where all They'll the guests will there, come. But they won't have people going in and out no, of them? No, no. Okay. Uh, so why is it necessary, once you go into the Madison Street space, <laughs> why is it necessary to have people being able to go left or right? At the, why, don't, why isn't it on one side that then <coughs> it would flow <coughs> through the two buildings? I'm going to try to articulate this. I'm, uh, this is when I wish that Brian was here. He could articulate it better. Well, I can maybe ask because, him. Because if you have to go, because then you have to go one way and you have to turn around and go the other way. I mean, it, it's like going into, a, going into a grocery store. Why would you only have to go one way? We have two separate gallery spaces. So going in and having your choice of where you want to start your exploration of the museum makes a lot of sense. But wouldn't most people want to see all of it? No, some people are very specific in what they're interested okay. in. I do like your, door, your idea about the automatic doors. I was thinking, how am I going to get, you know, even, even the um, automatic button like we have here yeah, is I mean, not particularly... I, I think, I, mean, I, know that, I know that there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm about what that will look like. Okay, and I have other questions that I'll ask at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Mei Hua Francis Lee. I, I've been have, uh, uh, with the door. Uh, with the Poland Art Museum for, uh, you know, member of year, about 15 years. And I moved to uh, Poland uh, 20 years ago, and I right away I joined the training and to be a docent. And also uh, I, you know, contributed to the Arm, Asia Art Council and uh, lots of activity and uh, helping the museum. And because I'm Chinese artist, I paint traditional Chinese work. I teach in the Poland Park Rec Center for many years. Yeah. Uh, at the time we did, which I joined the museum, we didn't have any training room. It's very small, just one building. And we even have to go to the, the film studio to do the training. Okay. But now they, and now it was in the, you know, 1994. Then we finally, we expanded, we bought the mock, you know, the Masonic Temple become a mock building. And then we can have a contemporary. Uh, gallery and the photograph gallery and all those uh, modern uh, art display area make uh, the garden, you know, make the uh, Poland Art Museum become much more. And so it is not only just a small city museum and become a state modern museum because we have modern art. Yeah, now we have a chance to become a national art museum because we're going to add the two buildings together and we can compete with the, uh, all the top museums in the United States. 
and I think it's a very good opportunity for everybody to be able to see uh, how Poland pers perspective and uh, positioning come on to develop in a very international city. And uh, I understand that we, we consider about the walkway, the open courtyard, but like I said, the city growing, we see a lot of uh, uh, display resident and lots of playground and special PSU and students walk around. And we do really hope uh, the museum will revive their uh, de design, make everybody accessible, still can cross the street, but with the uh, Roscoe Museum on the top and connect to building. That's why I urge uh, you know, commission and mayor and will understand that our expect for the big, the, you know, the city become a national city and to have a very famous museum in this United States. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor, City Commissioners. I'm Shirley Rackner. Uh, I'm not going to repeat any of the um, arguments or points made against changing the walkway. I won't talk about walkability, I won't talk about accessibility, and I won't talk about neighborhood process. I will say someone did mention that this affects just our neighborhood. I live on the fifth floor of the Elliott. I overlook our walkway between Madison 11th and 10th and the art museum's walkway. And I see people Monday nights, Sunday nights, people going to the theater, people going to um, the symphony, families walking in the afternoons to uh, go to the movies with their children. So our neighborhood's a really broad neighborhood. And I want to speak about the art museum. It is a wonderful gift that belongs to all of us in Portland and has created wonderful and inclusive programs. However, it's very confusing to me, and as I listened today, I became even more confused. How is it that allowing a space of eight feet by 10 feet in a walkway would hinder any of the museum's program attractiveness or its plans for a new beautiful building? I do hope the City Council will consider carefully what the landscape of Portland downtown will look like in another decade with this legal precedent of creating super blocks throughout downtown Portland. In addition, what will completely ignoring the walkability focus that is enshrined in our comprehensive plan mean for the future of citizen participation? Is it valid? and worthwhile process in the eyes of the council, or is it a foolish for Portlanders to participate in planning? By the way, the city council could invite a group of Portland architects to show how an eight by 10 foot exterior walkway could happen, and this would be the Portland way. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, colleagues, just a time check. We have about 19 people left, so that's approximately an hour of testimony. Can we hold our quorum? I'll All, right. Be here. All right, next three, please. Our Wilfred Mueller Crispin, Stephanie Parrish, and Charles Ryberg. And they'll be followed by Jan Holt, Chris Beck, and Holly L Lindauer. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and uh, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Wilfred Muller Crispin. Uh, I'm in opposition uh, to the proposed amendment to the uh, Portland Art Museum Street Vacation. Reading the Oregonian and the Willamette Week, it appears that the City Council decisions have been made on Pam's request already. A majority of council members have already expressed their support of Pam's plans to construct the class structure. One can only assume that council members have been courted by Pam and its PR company. Therefore, I feel very disheartened that my and any testimony opposing the Rothko Pavilion will be received with open minds. 
I'm here to request that the city not change the current ordinance and give away my right to an unencumbered passage. This is Pam's third request to change the Madison Street vacation ordinance. Granting the vacation is inconsistent, like we've heard so many times already, with Portland's 2035 comprehensive plans goals. Requiring pedestrian connectivity to parks and disallowing superblocks, which we also heard so many times already. Uh, with the ever-growing population of city center, we need more walkable streets, inviting corridors, certainly not fewer. We can all envision the next step when Pam will request further changes to the ordinance to totally prohibit us from passing through their class structure, their living room with elegant floors, furniture on a rainy, muddy day with bicycles, prams, umbrellas, etc. Only to obtain an ordinance change is the museum now willing to hire additional security to permit the public to move through the lobby of the pavilion while he claimed in the past that he could not hire additional security to allow access through the already existing ground level doors of the Mark building. A simple glass covered walkway from Pam's existing north entrance to the Mark building door would have provided this access a lot more economically and it still could. Pam's statements such as we are listening and the structure's final architecture will evolve and be determined at a later date are confusing. Early on, Pam definitely told the community that it had considered all the options to us their final and only solution, and that Pam did not desire public input on that matter. Chief Advancement Officer J.S. May to the Downtown Neighborhood Association said, this is just who we are. Thank you very much Thank for you, attention. Thank you, sir. We have the rest of the testimony <coughs> here as well. Thank you for submitting it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. A museum should be a two-way street that brings art and public together. These are the words of artist Paul Ramirez Jonas, who spent part of 2013 participating in a program at the Portland Art Museum that asked people from around the city to reflect on the role of art museums in contemporary civic life. For the last nine years, I have been a member of the museum's education team, where I proudly work with colleagues, artists, and many, many community partners who also care deeply in pushing for this idea of a museum as a two-way street. And not just that, but a two-way street that meets in a town square and is a gathering place for all kinds of art, people, and ideas. Next week, the Portland Art Museum turns 125, making it one of the oldest art museums in the country. A child of the early 20th century progressive era, the institution's early leaders raised the museum in a civic-minded educational institution that served a broad and general public. From early programs on city planning, free public art classes when there were very few to be found in Portland, deep relationships with Portland public schools, a weekly art radio, a show that broadcast from the galleries, and children's art collection that was installed at Kids Eye View, I'd argue that the DNA of the Portland Art Museum is, well, very Portland, and downright more quirky and diverse than one might think. I also believe its progressive era past very much connects us to the present. When I arrived at the museum, we had just announced funding for free admission for youth 17 and under, along with free school tours. This was a remarkable moment for continuing to move accessibility closer to the center of who we are. And today I believe we are only getting better at deepening our access through a growing number of programs and collaborations. Programs like Art Now for people living with dementia and their care partners, monthly gallery experiences for people who are blind or partially sighted, community-centered initiatives like Object Stories that share the voices of everyday folks reflecting on the personal meanings of objects and the current exhibition, We Construct Marvels, which an entire floor has been given over to uh, artist-driven and community-based projects. So I really believe that a driving question we ask ourselves is what does Portland want and need from its hometown art museum today that is both similar and perhaps radically different from the past? I would suggest that it is not just a museum of collections, but a collective museum. And I think the museum's history of our ongoing accessibility points us in this direction. I hope that the outcome of today's decision is a vote to support this direction too, and a belief that the museum and its many communities can collaborate on a final use and design planning of a Rothko Pavilion. So it is truly a two-way street and a town square for us all. Thank you. Next three, please. Uh, was there a Charles Ryberg? 
then we'll go ahead and go with Jan Holt, Chris Beck, and Holly Lindauer. And they'll be followed by Deanna Mueller Crispin, Alice Lloyd, and Doug Klotz. Good afternoon. Hi. I'm Holly Lindauer. Um, I started my first ever petition this weekend. I'm very excited. <laughs> um, it went online, and uh, we also had paper. Um, uh, since this weekend, we are close to 500 signatures from concerned local neighbors and residents from all over the city, uh, business owners, uh, people from high rises, uh, affordable housing units, uh, all of these residents who do not want to lose this easement. I'm a Portland resident. Uh, my 20 plus year architectural career included working for Skidmore Owings and Merrill in New York and working with uh, Duwani Platter Zyberg urban planners who have advised Portland on new pedestrianism and urbanism. I learned from them that the appeal of any city is in its public spaces, not in its private spaces. In 1968, the city council understood this and provided accessible, comfortable, carefree passage on, car-free, excuse me, uh, as well as carefree on the vacated public Madison Street. The ordinance inspired mixed-use neighborhood, and for decades, Madison Plaza has been a successful living room, open to all 24-7, because neighborhood life is 24-7. Understandably, the Portland Art Museum needs to expand, but the proposed enclosure of Madison Plaza creates a private living room, open 7 to 11, providing a guarded passageway for what is typically 1,500 pedestrians, bicycle riders, dog walkers every day of the year up a ramp through humidity-controlled airlock doors, past the ticketing counter, through a store, and through the other set of airlock doors, diminishes the public's accessibility. It's costly, it's not sustainable. Alternatively, the museum can incorporate door-free passage for the public as prescribed by the easement. The result will benefit both the museum and our city's vitality. Please recognize what the City Council of 1968 understood. The museum can accomplish its goals without changing the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Janet Holt. Um, the, I've been a docent since 1965 at the Portland Art Museum. The Portland Art Museum offers viewers the opportunity to learn more about our fellow, fellow human beings from centuries ago to the present. Viewers may be high children, high school, college students, adults. I have led tours for children and also for adults with disabilities. It is very important to them to be able to see what they want to see. However, it can be challenging to go from the Belushki building to the Mark building, not to mention time consuming. Part of the museum's goal is to have guests enthusiastic about the viewing experience rather than frustrated as to how to get from here to there. Yes, there are maps to help. Still, the goals are to keep things simple, have more exhibition space, and to keep up with the times. It makes sense not to have a pedestrian pathway between 10th Avenue and the park blocks. Why? Would it make sense to have such a path severing the Metropolitan Museum, the Louvre, the de Young, or the Legion of Honor? No way. Huge numbers of people something like 50,000 last month alone, and two to 300,000 a year, visit the museum compared to the few in the neighborhood who want to keep the pathway. When we look at art, our imaginations are often stimulated. The design for connect connecting the two buildings is appealing to our imaginations as well as a magnificent upgrade to Portland's cultural district. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chris Beck, Portland resident and art museum member. Uh, what a tremendous opportunity involving one of Portland's iconic intersections and one of our city's most important civic institutions. 
I bring a perspective uh, uh, until last year. I was working for the Obama administration in Washington, D.C. on community development issues. One of the uh, hats I wore got me involved with a consortium of national foundations that were um, building, uh, supporting projects around the country around something they call creative placemaking, which is uh, an effort to connect community development issues with arts, and artists and, and arts approaches so that the arts was not isolated from community development and vice versa. Through that uh, effort, I became familiar with this whole uh, practice of, of creative placemaking. And again, this was supported by some of the largest funders in the country of philanthropies. I think it would be interesting for you to think about how you might encourage the community and the museum and other interests to employ some community engagement work um, with this increasingly recognized community development approach that's not just the architect and the institution and politicians and a few planners, but the whole community. Yeah, that's this, right. This space merits that. I think you have the opportunity to lead this a conversation about this space that results in something that is um, perhaps better than what is on the table today. But I think all the objectives the museum wants to um, pursue are, are important. It's a, a space that doesn't work really well yet. And it could I be a lot better. Since the last hearing, I don't think that has really happened. It was not really all that much of a change in the proposal since last time. And there doesn't seem to have been that coming together of, I mean, the three of you have very different and, and helpful opinions on it. So that I, I appreciate your, your statement because I'm not sure this would have been the time because once the decision is made, unless it's to go back to the drawing board again, it's, not, it's going to be with the architects and the planners. I don't have a dog in the fight. I haven't followed this that closely. Yeah. I, 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 it's one of my important, my favorite places in the city is Teddy Roosevelt and Lincoln and the church and the museum and Belusky. It, it's a great spot. And that walkway should have some access. There's lots of ways to do it, probably lots of ways none of us have thought about. If you've been to the British Museum in London uh, in 2000, they built the dome over the core of the British Museum. Um, which had been closed <laughs> for <laughs> ever. <laughs> and that opened the heart of the British Museum um, to the public. It's, I think they have free admission or used to. Oh, we still do. I still think do. Last time I go in, anyway. and it's, but it's transformed yeah. the visitor experience, the museum. It's also created a wonderful uh, space the public can enjoy. I don't know if you can bring dogs in there, but I'm all for dogs and bikes, by the way. Uh, well, in, in whatever comes, I'll vote for that. It's nice to see you back yeah, in Portland. Sorry, but thank you. Good luck. Yeah, thanks for your testimony. Thanks, thanks all three of you. Thank you. Next three are Deanna Mueller Crispin, Alice Lloyd, and Doug Klotz. And they'll be followed by Izzy Armenta, Randy Craig, and Ian Gillingham. And again, if anybody prefer to come downstairs, I think we have seats for, for everybody if you'd like to do that. But you're certainly welcome to stay there too. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I'm Deanna Mueller Crispin. I am a longtime member of the museum and also a user since 1990 of the Madison Passageway from downtown. And have long supported increasing accessibility between and within PAM's buildings. But the Roscoe, Roscoe, Rothko Pavilion proposal is not the best and certainly not the only way to increase people with disabilities or general accessibility to the museum. Here's why. First, from the drawings that we have so far, the proposed new handicapped ramp entrance would be much steeper and more difficult to navigate than the existing one to enter the museum or just to pass through as folks can today. Second, both the proposed two new banks of sorely needed elevators and the two new sets of staircases are inside the existing buildings. They would have nothing to do with the new glass pavilion, per se. 
On the other hand, a sky bridge option on the top floors would allow <coughs> clear passageways between the two buildings, preserve an iconic view, and leave the pedestrian easement free and clear for the hundreds of neighbors who now use it every day. Pam's claim that the pavilion knits the campus together with the surrounding neighborhood could not be further from the truth. It would create a huge permanent barrier, both physical and psychological, between South Park blocks and 10th, 11th Street streetcar stops. This violates several connectivity policies in the newly adopted plan. The right for the public to the use the vacated Madison Avenue passageway belongs to the public. Pam's only claim to use it at all is by complying with the terms of their street vacation ordinances, including keeping an open mall. Many neighborhood residents use the passageway outside of Pam's proposed open hours, walking home from late movies, leaving early in the morning to get to work or go to the airport. The passageway, in my experience, as opposed to an earlier speaker, is clean, well illuminated, and safe, and has few, if any, loiterers. None of this can be said for the alternative routes. And I just have one more thing to say, if I might, <coughs> for a second. Um, I find it a little ironic that this is being called the Rothko Pavilion. First of all, the Rothko paintings will not be in the class pavilion at all. In the museum's info, it says, the Rothkos will be in a light-controlled gallery adjacent to the new Rothko Pavilion, in addition to which they will only be there for 20 years. That is the only time that they will be loaned to the museum. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Hello, my name is Doug Klotz. Um, I am a member of the city's pedestrian advisory committee, have been for several decades, <laughs> and, uh, but I'm not speaking for them. I do want to point out, though, that the combined, a combined meeting of the pedestrian advisory committee and the bicycle advisory committee both uh, had a, uh, sent a letter in April, and they've resent that just yesterday opposing this, this uh, change to the ordinance. Um, and these are the committees that the city looks to for advice on pedestrian and bicycle uh, matters. Um, that, and so I, I oppose, you know, a, a removing the uh, allowance for free passage through the street, through the Madison Street Plaza. Uh, it seems to me, as, as was pointed out, the design of the, of the Rothko Pavilion as it is now. Um, Don't get quite so close to it. Okay. Uh, yeah, the design as it is now could be modified without substantially changing it, since we now know that there's going to be almost no art in it, no elevators in it, and no stairs in it. It's just horizontal passage. Um, so at the ground floor, you take a one section of that and have the walls go the other way, have that be a passageway, and then you'd have, you'd have a door to the left and a door to the right, and you'd have to be able to enter either one. On the other hand, if you close it, there'll still have to be a guard here and a guard there. So it, the staffing is the same, and that passageway could, wouldn't have to be a dark tunnel. It could be a, a glass passageway. Um, and uh, it would still allow people to see, see what's in the museum as they pass through. Um, and you know, the, it would be visible from, or for security purposes. If it's, this is glass, that's glass, it's all glass. Um, I think this, this, that could work. And I, I don't see any of the downsides that are described otherwise um, of, block, of not being able to, to circulate through there. They still have room for a lobby there. And um, the pedestrian access from the park, from Park Avenue, which they're proposing to, to add steps, they're, they're not there now because they're raising it four feet. So they're, they're adding a bunch of steps and putting a ramp on the side. I think that ramp could be made more, more generous. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you both. Next third, please. Are Izzy Armenta, Randy Gregg, and Ian Gillingham. And they'll be followed by Laura Paulini, De La Rosa Margulies, and John Zarnecki. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Izzy Armenta um, with Oregon Walks. Oregon Walks is a state pedestrian advocacy organization. <clears throat> and we work to ensure that walking is safe, accessible, and convenient for all Oregonians. I'm here to express our opposition to the motion to amend the public easement. That was a condition on the street vacation at the Madison Plaza adjacent to the Portland Art Museum. Um, there were good reasons for the requirement to maintain public access as a condition of the street vacation, and those conditions still exist today. Portland has long had a policy and practice of maintaining pedestrian access when a street is vacated. Um, out, of the, 
out of direction travel discourages walking and affects pedestrians more so than other people using other modes of transportation. Um, in the recommended draft of the Portland Central City 2035 plan, climate action plan, comprehensive plan, and transportation system plan, and I'm sure I'm forgetting one plan, all include goals to maintain and improve walkability, accessibility, and connections. Council should not ignore its own policies by closing off a key walkway connecting Southwest Park and Southwest 10th. We ask this connection be protected for decades to come. Um, the offer to keep the proposed pavilion open to the public for a few more hours and to prove accessibility is insufficient. The amendment does not prevent the art museum from restricting access in the future. Um, and if the amendment were to be approved, any future access changes should be approved by the city. Again, we ask the city council to deny the art museum's request to amend the Madison Plaza street ubication until a building design is available that demonstrates improved access and maintains connectivity rather than creating a new barrier. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, my name is Randy Craig. Um, I have been both a foe and a friend of the museum in my 27 years in Portland. I spent 17 years writing on architecture and urban planning for the Oregonian. One of them dealing with the rather misguided 2005 expansion of the museum into the Masonic Temple, backed with quotes by, from th three of the city's most prominent architects, one of whom, Bob Frasca, actually oversaw the design of the Hoffman Wing, the 1972 edition. I wrote several columns opposing the uh, misguided design of this connection. Sadly, our advice was not heeded. The previous museum administration not only left the museum in millions of dollars in debilitating debt, but with a facility that is entirely dysfunctional. The public spirit of this museum runs very, very deep. In the 1930s, when the first phase was built, museums were windowless vaults. Anna B. Crocker, then director, and architect Pietro Beluski gave us a museum accessible to the street, permeable with windows and natural light. Crocker created some of the first public education programs in the country. I wish the last edition had fulfilled the spirit of that history, fully addressing 10th Avenue and the streetcar, creating not just a functional connection, but a beautiful one between the two buildings. I wish the galleries were not bowling alleys in the new, in the, in the Masonic Temple. What I really wish is that there had been a master plan for the entire cultural district with that um, move. But alas, none of that happened. Brian Fariso, um, came on and took on the formidable task of digging our muse museum out of multiple messes left behind. And he also gave us our museum back with a robust menu of free days and discounts and rosters of exhibits that devoted to our regional heritage. I think the spirit of the museum is, is now intact and to truly function, the museum really needs this connection. The conceptual direction of the design strongly suggests an intent that if executed well will not only fix the many problems others here have outlined today, but will also add a unique space and experience to our civic environment, a little winter garden. What's more, the clock is ticking. The list of people willing to write seven and eight figure checks for facilities for the public to enjoy is getting shorter with each passing day. Um, I'll just share one little last little thing with you. Louis, Louis Kahn described Portland as a Lilliputian city for its itty bitty blocks. <laughs> yes, the 200 foot block is important. It's a really important pattern, but it's also constricting. Uh, there's a lot of things we can't do in it. And I don't know that we can actually do a functioning museum without giving up one super block uh, to the city. One block from New York here is not gonna destroy the fabric of the city. So I urge you to approve this. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ian Gillingham. I work at the Portland Art Museum. Uh, I work with local and national media, including Randy sometimes, on coverage of, uh, on coverage of the, the museum. And I also edit the Portal member magazine that you may get in your mailboxes a few times a year. Uh, so a big part of my job is outreach to the various communities through media channels to boost awareness of the art and programs and find new ways to welcome people into our museum. And from that perspective, I want to offer my strong support of the Rothko Pavilion and the ordinance modification to enclose a section of the public passage. I don't need to add much to the perspectives you've already heard, uh, but I want to emphasize that this pavilion plan includes important changes to ensure and improve not only access through, but also access to. 
access to great works of art and creative inspiration, access to curator talks, docent tours, to programs and spaces that invite in members of the community who haven't always felt welcome at this museum. In my four years at the museum, I've been proud to see and be part of the progress the museum has made in becoming a more accessible and inclusive institution. And I want to thank you for considering approval of structural improvements that will support that work for the community. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. The next three are Laura Paulini, De La Rosa Margulies, and John Zarnecki. And then the last two will be Jim Winkler and Tim Davis. Thank you all for your patience. Would you like to go ahead and start? Sure. Yours? Thank you. I'm Laura Paulini. I'm an artist and a member of the Portland Art Museum. Mayor Wheeler and commissioners, thank you for this opportunity to voice my support for the construction of a new pavilion between the existing Portland Art Museum buildings. In addition to making the museum more accessible to all while maintaining and even improving safety in the space, I believe the building of this pavilion will enhance the museum's ability to contribute much needed positive experiences to the cultural life of Portland, to its citizens, and to its ever-growing number of visitors. Doing whatever we can as a city to make the Portland Art Museum as welcoming and inclusive as possible seems like a very obvious goal. In our case, however, we find ourselves inheritors of a good institution in a wonderful location, but housed in buildings that have been repurposed with mixed results and poor accessibility. With continued community involvement, I believe that the new pavilion could help make the Portland Art Museum a truly great and inclusive institution. As a high school student in the 1970s in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I attended my regular public high school in the mornings, but traveled downtown to a satellite art class at the Milwaukee Art Museum in the afternoons. This program was part of an effort to mix and integrate students throughout the city and included more than a dozen area public high schools. We spent hours drawing in the galleries, studying the collection, and getting a behind the scenes take on the running of the institution. I felt welcomed, challenged, and understood there in ways that I didn't at my regular high school, where sports took precedence over art. The generosity of the museum staff was remarkable, and their interest in our futures opened our eyes to the possibility of careers in the arts. With their encouragement and guidance, I became the first in my family to go to college, <laughs> earning both a BFA and an MFA in visual arts. Forgive me. Uh, knowing the impact that a strong, vibrant art museum had on me as a young person, I humbly ask all of you to consider doing everything you can to support the Portland Art Museum as it attempts to grow and stay relevant and engaged. Allowing our museum to become the best institution it can be by enhancing accessibility for all is quite simply our obligation. There are many people from all walks of life and all levels of income who are nourished and enriched by encounters with art. A great city needs a great museum. I encourage you all to support the Pavilion Project. Thank sorry, you. Sorry for the emotion. Oh, no, that's great. Uh, Sharing, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, uh, there's a lot of passion sorry. behind that. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you for your yeah. patience. Sure. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Christine Nelson, and I've been a docent at the museum for 16 years, and I'm here to uh, give you some reasons why I strongly support the Roth Cove Pavilion. As a docent, I lead tours for adults and for children. I also participate in tours for people with no or low vision. And I also had an aging parent who liked to come to the museum in the last years of her life, but had issues with mobility and dementia. So I've learned um, quite a bit about how to look at things through somebody else's eyes. And um, these are some things that we will get with the Rothko Pavilion that I feel very strongly that we need. One are easily accessible restrooms on the main floor. And although the museum has eliminated the needs for a key to get into the restroom on the two individual bathrooms on the main floor, um, th that's just a patch on the problem. Everyone needs to go to the bathroom, and sometimes people need it more urgently than others. 
Currently, you have to wriggle through our small and very popular gift shop to get to the two individual bathrooms. And once there, you don't have immediate access if somebody else is using them. So either situation can, what I say, dampen your enthusiasm for being in the museum. <laughs> now pause to consider what that's like if you're blind, if you're using a walker, or if you're in a wheelchair, or if you're a parent with small children who desperately need to use the restroom. It's a very fundamental issue, but it's humiliating for people uh, just to have to beg to find the restroom and then not, not be able to use it when they need to. As for the CMCA, people are astounded there are no restrooms on the, four, on the four floors in the CMCA. There's also no place to sit. One docent came across as what she described as a small, elderly, tired couple sitting on the Saul LeWitt cube, which was on display. She did not have the heart to tell them they could not, they should not have been sitting on, a, on that piece of art. She didn't have the heart to tell them to get up because it's very tiring to walk through four floors, which are cement floors, and not sit down once in a while. Um, Get the access, I'm not going to talk about because Brian has talked about that a lot, but it's a real maze to get there. Even those of us who love contemporary art and have a spare 20 minutes in the museum, when you're in the Belusky building, we just think it's too much effort to go over there if I'm going to the third or fourth floor. Um, but if with this proposal, the Rothko Pavilion would dramatically approve all of that. The final thing on, on uh, accessibility is with school tours. Currently, we deploy school tours from the Hoffman Gallery. And schools come, and sometimes they're bringing up to 60 students in each tour. And sometimes there are multiple schools coming at 9.30, multiple schools coming at 10, multiple schools coming at 10.30. If you're going to go into the CMCA, you have to snake all those kids through the Vilusky building. Whereas if you have a double entry, um, you can deploy them directly into that building and you don't have to waste their time traveling up slow elevators and claw across and down staircases. I just want Weather, to interrupt and say It rains in Portland and we all know it. And with this pavilion, people would have a very welcoming place to wait either before the museum opens or while they're standing in some of the long lines that we're seeing now with the Leica exhibit and the Wyeth exhibition. Years ago, I volunteered on Saturdays at the museum, and the atmosphere there was akin to a cathedral. It was hushed and very reverent. And during the course of the afternoon, when I was kind of used to be a, an augmented security staff member, I would be in a, sent to a gallery or two, and sometimes I would see three or four people, and that was it for the afternoon. The museum now is a totally different place. It's dynamic, it's vibrant, it's diverse. And this is a result of the museum's commitment to diverse programming, programmings which uh, welcome many different groups, including those who have visual or physical disabilities, veterans, people who have dementia, people from the LGBTQIA plus community, and many, many other people. With the Roscoe Pavilion, we could much better serve that community and expand our programming. I want one more quick, quick comment. I well remember the Myron Frank department store, and people would say, let's meet under the clock, which was in the middle of the first floor. And I can envision the Rothko Pavilion becoming that same kind of meeting point for Portlanders. Thank you for considering my testimony. Thank you. We appreciate it. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I'm John Zarnicki. Uh, I'm former chair of the Portland Historic Landmarks Commission. I speak today in support of maintaining continuous all hours, all day pedestrian access from Southwest 10th Avenue to the South Park blocks via the former Madison Street alignment, now known as Madison Plaza. Restricting continuous public access deprives Portland citizens and visitors the originally planned relationship of the city grid to an essential portion of this unique public space. Importance of the intended connection at this point in the city street system was further discussed during the planning of museum expansion to the Mark Building before the Portland Historic Landmarks Commission and the Portland Design Commission in 2004-2005. At that time, the decision to maintain access was upheld as a condition for approval of the project. The promise for easy access to Portland parks is further supported by current intentions out outlined in the 2035 plan. Please hold to the promise that continues the best opportunity for the public use of this critically delightful resource by maintaining continuous all hours pedestrian access between 10th Avenue and Park, Bus 
and the park blocks. Portland's parks are the lungs of the city. Keep them easily available to all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks all three of you. The last person I show signed up is Jim Winkler. Yeah, that's fine. Now this is a lot of pressure you're under here. Oh, listen, I get to I get to play cleanup. <laughs> I'm Jim Winkler, and I wondered what I was going to say when I was sitting back there. Because I think of this project as a crucial legacy project for the art museum with which I've been associated for some 30 years. Earlier on, I heard someone talk about an iconic, wealthy private institution. And I thought about the educational department, and you've heard people speak of it. When Portland Public Schools didn't have money to educate students, we created a robust educational institute organization that supported teachers, that provided lesson plans before and after visitation. And not only is attendance by these school kids free, but we actually pay for the transportation as well. I think what I've seen in the last 10 years is the democratization of the museum. And in part, the naming of the pavilion, the Rothko Pavilion, naming the pavilion after an important artist, as opposed to naming it after an important wealthy donor, is emblematic of what we're trying to achieve. This is the city of Portland and the state of Oregon's museum. It has gone from becoming a, from being a somewhat modest organization to a nationally recognized organization. And at the risk of embarrassing Brian, Brian has served and been elected by his peers to be the president of the National Association of Museum Directors. This is a highly prestigious position that reflects the high esteem in which he's held. The Rothko Pavilion is truly synergetic. I too have had two and a half hours without water. It will correct the deficiencies that Randy identified and by creating one portal make visiting seamless whether you're going to the contemporary galleries or the Northwest Native collections. It is a threshold improvement that will vastly improve the user experience of the 345,000 people a year who come to visit us. And it'll add 14,000 plus square feet of galleries. I urge you to support the museum by modifying the ordinance and allow us to proceed and raise the funds we need to build this important contribution to Portland's legacy. Thank you. Thank you. Does that complete our public testimony? That's all who signed up. So uh, Commissioner Fish uh, needed to step out of the room and he requested we take a, a brief recess uh, until he's able to come back and participate. But in the meanwhile, I don't know if my colleagues here had questions that they wanted to follow up on. Having uh, drunk about six cups of tea this afternoon, I would actually welcome a, a small OK, break so why, why don't we do this? Why don't we take about a, uh, let's reconvene here at a quarter past five, and then let's have a conversation. Uh, for those of you upstairs, if you wouldn't mind just joining us here, we're a small enough group now, we can just have a community conversation here. Thank you. We'll Thank take you. a recess.
done with our recess. We're back in session. Uh, Director Friso, would you mind coming back up? I think Commissioner Fritz has a couple of questions. And Mr. Janik, if you'd like to come on up, you're certainly welcome to do that too. Commissioner Fritz. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks to everybody who's still here and for all the good testimony. I thought it was a really great hearing. Um, I'm looking at the information that was just given out in terms of the Madison Street changes frequently asked questions. And under what are the benefits of enclosing the passageway, it was very clear that the museum, what the benefits to the museum and the public visiting the museum are. I did the only um, testimony that I heard that made it, it the proposal a benefit to the public was the potluck in the park folk who were looking forward to sheltering folks um, while they were waiting for Christmas dinner or holiday meal rather. Um, but my real question, my main question is, uh, the, the, the bottom uh, bullet here is what about other options like a sky bridge? And the answer is the sky bridge would not work because ground level accessibility is the goal of the project. It seemed, I was so hopeful earlier this year that you would go away, you would meet with the neighborhood, you would figure out a configuration that would still allow the easement because it, to me, the, the um, value of people being able to walk through without having to open a door or feel like they're going into an enclosed space, that, that's also a clear public benefit. Sure. So why didn't, why didn't those discussions yeah. happen? Oh, they actually did. I and mean, we had a number of discussions with people in the community and we opened up um, some conversations in, in various groups. And I, I think the testimony, we went back and heard a lot of the testimony and, and it was very uh, strong at the last uh, meeting in April and, um, and really thought a lot about how we maintain that public access through. But that's I not think, my question. My question is why not a sky bridge? Oh, we want, we think it's really important to have one consistent floor on the base level. And that's so important, I think, to the museum, but also by having a structure in that space, we feel by adding light and security and clarifying the space. If you know the space now, there are nooks and crannies, there's various um, uh, elevation changes, and we feel by clarifying that space architecturally, uh, and, and not only on the exterior, but also on the interior, we're improving safety and clarity and really contributing at what we feel to the, the, the fabric of the city. And then taking it a step further, I think uh, as a pedestrian <coughs> or anyone who um, moves through those areas and those blocks, I feel by clarifying and cleaning architecturally and design-wise, we really improve significantly. So the things I heard from the community were accessibility through to maintain the various hours. I think the other very important aspect, and Nicole Sharon was really clear on this, and I thought it has a great idea of aligning the hours with the streetcar, which I think is really important, and the museum being part of that is something I'm excited about. <coughs> So again, I, I would say that we have had a number of conversations, and those conversations will continue. One other point, uh, the gentleman who spoke about placemaking, I thought he made a very, very good point. We've been in discussions, if we're approved here, to move forward with another nonprofit organization to help facilitate those discussions. Um, I think the people who have testified against that, uh, this proposal, we want to meet with them and I want to hear them. Um, I think it is important and to hear their advice. We have not designed ultimately what this will look like because we have multiple steps to go. So I, I don't know if you're even going to consider uh, the modified sky bridge with a small um, passageway, There's, I can give you or uh, copy for you the, the retired architect who came and gave his rendition of, of how it might look. But having most of the passageway enclosed in the building um, and then the, the smaller, eight, the eight foot easement, which would then have much more eyes on it because you'd, as was pointed out, you need your staff there to look after the artwork all the time. Yeah. Why would it not work? I, and I asked the question of somebody who was testifying, but in many of the museums that I've gone to, there isn't a choice of you go to the in, uh, where you're going to pay or check in, whatever, right. whichever, and then you're kind of led through um, the main exhibits. Mm -hmm. So why is it important to have the choice of going one way or the other? Well, I think, again, this idea that let's say you had to go left up and over to the modern wing across a bridge is really not in, in the spirit of the accessibility that we're trying to achieve. But isn't the um, Jubit's, uh, what we call it, the Mark building? Yes. That entrance is going to stay open or no? 
um, will that will that entrance that's currently there that is accessible will that be um, will people will be able to go in that way or will that be closed off as well as the art museum one? Uh, both would be a uh, part of the structure and that floor would be raised four feet and then we'd have one continuous floor. But people would not be able to get in directly into the um, Jubit. Yes, they would. Park building. Yes. yes, they would. They would. Yes. You could walk in and go right into the jubits and yeah. left into the where you come i mean i used that i went to a wedding there which was really nice but um also go to oh, a number of events you're talking about where the event spaces are yes that will remain everything will remain except i would suggest given our really need to significantly invest in accessibility some of those spaces and doorways and passageways need to be looked at with an, uh, an accessibility lens so I'm gathering then that there's another portion apart from the event space that's got more art stuff on it. Yes, in our, that building? Our, our building's divided in three different sections. The Mark building has, um, it has galleries, vertical galleries, and you've heard them uh, talked about as sort of a, a bowling alley. You have the rental spaces, which are in the center, which has a different entry where you've been to weddings and other things. Yeah. And then the other third on the north side is where the offices are. Okay, that's helpful. Yeah. yeah, I could pull up drawings, but gets a little cumbersome. Well, the other thing I wanted to mention while we do have many docents here is that I realize that my job now is not nearly as difficult as theirs. Is, uh, <laughs> one time, and I don't, I'm not as familiar with your building because I still have PTSD, except when I go to jolly events, uh, chaperoning a school trip. And uh, I, I admired the docents, let's just put it that, and, and the lady who said that you deploy from a certain place. It sounds like a military op operation, and absolutely, the, was done very, very well. Mayor, can I, can I just say fish. one comment? And yes. First of all, I want to echo what Commissioner, we're not voting today, but I want to echo what Commissioner Fritz said about the, um, the hearing today. Um, <clears throat> I had to step aside a couple times because we're on the clock in a negotiation with the EPA, and it's not an easy negotiation, and so I'm overseeing it, and I, I apologize, but we have TVs on in my office, so I didn't miss anything. But I tell you, um, one of the things I thought of as, as different people came and framed this, this, this debate from their perspective, I, I began to think a little bit about Washington Park, and I'll tell you why. When we're doing, uh, Commissioner Fritz is leading an effort to do a new master plan for Washington Park. The truth is that um, in the default mode, the people we would hear the most from would probably be Arlington Heights because Arlington Heights has historically felt that they get the short end of parking and growth and other things because they're the most adjacent neighborhood. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how can we improve circulation and other things so we don't negatively impact one neighborhood. When, when my earliest conversation with Commissioner Fritz about Washington Park, she reminded me that it is a regional asset. And she wondered why no one from East Portland was in the conversation, why no one from other parts of our city was part of the conversation. And it actually is a very good point because we, we tend to think of certain things as being I, uh, Im, uh, the impacts in terms of just sort of like a, 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 you know, sort of a radius around some entity and we say who's most immediately impacted. But we have certain resources, cultural resources, public resources in our community that serve the region. And so um, I'm going to think a lot about the testimony, and we might have some follow-up questions. But I actually found that the public benefit question was more clearly defined for me at the end of this hearing, because a number of people came and, and, and insisted that we broaden the frame and look at the public benefit as being not just the city and the region, but our whole brand as a, as a cultural capital, not just the 300,000 people who come, but the reputation of our city, and on and on. And Randy Gregg, I think, spoke to that. So um, the tendency for, in our work is, is to look at the most immediate impact. And that's fair. And, and I understand why people a block away would, would feel particularly aggrieved. Just like in Washington Park. I understand if you live in Arlington Heights, the traffic <laughs> is more impactful. But these are regional, in some cases, even larger than regional uh, institutions. And for me, this comes down to a classic balancing test between a public benefit defined more broadly and a public burden defined more narrowly, and how do you balance the two? Commissioner Fritz has, has appropriately, I think, 
you know, put out this question about, well, can a redesign strike a different balance? But that's, it's still the same question. What's the balance? And how do you get there? But I, I just for one felt that this hearing helped me better understand at least a perspective on what I'll call the broader public benefit. And I think that has to be balanced against whatever burden we've heard. And that's our job. That's what we ultimately have to make a decision in balancing those two. So I appreciate it. Thank you. And if I might just riff off that, uh, Commissioner, if this moves forward, then I think there can be some things that would um, make a public benefit for the people who are currently freely going through. Um, somebody mentioned about the, public, about the bathroom that you have to get to through the gift store. If there were an accessible all-user restroom that was accessible to the public in that pavilion area, that to me would be a public benefit. People said, you know, um, it's the maybe the children in the park blocks who might need to use that. So I'd, I would really appreciate you considering that. And then what else can you do to make it more welcoming? Um, the example was given of Big Pink. Well, lots of people don't know that you can actually go through Big Pink and it's not very welcoming. So how would you let folks know the automatic doors I thought was a really good idea? Um, how else can you um, right. encourage people to use it? Yeah, I think, I think certainly automatic doors is a possibility. Maybe there's airlocks. Maybe they're not even doors during certain hours. Um, I think through the community listening process that I think we want to go under or take on, uh, if someone said to us public restrooms in the pavilion would be of interest, we would look at that and see what the feasibility is. Mm -hmm. I think we really do want to listen and we want to hear. Um, it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg. There's no doubt about it. There's a lot of money that has to be raised. And, uh, but at the same time, it, balancing out, um, making sure that we listen to the community and become part of the, the neighborhood is so important. Yeah, we actually do have a formal process of the good neighbor agreement, which we found really helpful in contentious issues to get everybody to the table <coughs> and see, well, we can't please everybody all the way, but what is there that we could do that would make it a bit better? I, I learned a very important lesson early in my career. It's really about listening. And, uh, and people uh, need to feel comfortable with picking up the phone and calling me. And uh, I've had some people call me this week, and they came over and we met. And that's important. And I think we all want to achieve the highest levels of success with our community and with our cultural um, uh, institutions, as well as uh, what we aspire to as a city in balancing all those uh, different factors. I, I feel that uh, I will say this to anyone in the room. If you do need to call me, pick up the phone. and. I will meet with pe a lot of people. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I also want to acknowledge your leadership of getting the institution back up to a really Thank good you. fitting. Um, I, I, I appreciate that. And also, when there is a convener by a neutral party, rather than anybody being there, call me. Um, so I would really appreciate it. Maybe we could talk offline of, of a consideration of some kind of a good neighbor agreement so that the concerns that you've heard can be addressed to the extent <clears throat> that they can. Absolutely. So I, I, I want to add just an oddball issue here, and that is this. Uh, you know, there was a lot of disagreement in this room today and lots of differences of opinion on this subject, but I heard a consensus around you, Brian, mm -hmm. and uh, the direction that you've taken the art museum during your tenure. And I will tell you, I am both delighted for you and slightly nervous about the honor that's just been bestowed upon you at the national level. Mm -hmm. You definitely deserve it. You'll represent the city well. And don't forget, you're this city. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, do not let them entice you. At any rate, uh, call so we, need, we need to vote on the amendment. We do, but does yeah, anybody okay. have vote any more questions amendment. before I call the question on the amendment? Very good. Carla, please call the roll on the amendment. And in review, this amendment um, guarantee, adds uh, both a finding and a direction that the, um, the pavilion will be open for public passage. Um, for the streetcar hours. For the streetcar hours, hours basically. Street yes. hours, well. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Aye. Fish. Um, I'm going to support this. Um, the one the, We did hear, I think, one interesting point, one of many interesting points raised during the testimony was is there a circumstance under which you would be relieved of your obligation? And I, the first thing that I thought of, because I was once upon a time with, in a mayor's absence in charge of the city's response to a monster storm, is the city did tell people to stay home and not, not to go out and put themselves at risk. So there, I, I can imagine a scenario 
where we have the kind of paralyzing storm where there is a possibility that this and other places are not open. Um, what I also think, though, is to those who've said that at some point down the road, this could be disregarded or somehow dismissed. If the council requires this as a condition of the easement, I, I have no, absolutely no doubt that the museum will honor it to the best of their ability, acts of God notwithstanding. But um, there are certain events that happen, particularly snow emergencies, where you just physically can't get people out and institutions have been closed, including places like City Hall. So I, I, I just was aware of that. Hi. Saltzman. Hi. Wheeler. Hi. The amendment is adopted. Okay. Commissioner Fritz. So on, on Commissioner Fisher's point, I don't know what the solution is, but I think the concern is that it was vacated in 68 with certain conditions and then that condition was kind of whittled away at and now we're back again. So I think the concern, Commissioner Fisher, is not, it is partly about, you know, uh, storms and such, but it's also, you know, in 20 years, as was mentioned, it's 200,000 a year to keep it open. We don't want to do that. And it's our building anyway, so how about if we just get rid of that? So I don't know how to um, insure against that. Um, but we'd have to, I mean, I, the insurance that I think of, as long as I have the honor of serving on this body, is it would have to come back to council. Yeah, but that didn't help in this particular, if, if this gets approved, that hasn't protected the public uh, walkway uh, to this, you know, th as, it's, as it currently exists. So I, I just want us to think about, is there any way to make sure that in the future, um, and I have no particular suggestions, but let's all think about that. Well, uh, Commissioner, one thing I might add is the proposed ordinance also has an easement document attached to it to implement the ordinance. It's sort of a belt and suspenders. So that easement runs in favor of the city. So the ultimate answer is this or, this or a future council can always change either the easement or the ordinance but it will require the action of this or future council. Right, and we're not, the future council is not going to say back, knock down the pavilion. So I, I, that's not entirely. No, but that, I'm referring to the hours that you were concerned about. I know, but that they can come back to council in 20 years time and say, well, we don't want to do it anymore. Council might say yes. Well, and in fairness, that would apply to every single issue that we take up as a council. There is the possibility of someone seeking relief. I, I think we've made a record, however, of the council feeling we have at least put a marker down in this amendment that the hours of operation are, are fundamental to the easement if the council chooses to proceed. Very good. Thank you uh, for being here. Thank you, everybody who testified this afternoon and into the evening. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading as amended. Next week. Thank you. Next week. Next week. Thank, Thank you all. We are Thank adjourned. You. Thank it's you. Not, Carla, Carla, it's not time certain, right? It's just no. regular. It's on the regular agenda.